It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. What a panel this week. Lisa Schmeiser is here. She's editor IT Pro Today. Lindsay Turrentine from CBS Interactive. Sam Moscovich from uh, Ars Technica. And we are going to talk about everything from Bezos balls to Instagram shopping to low latency 5G and the tickle shackle. It's all coming up next on Twit. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 706, recorded Sunday, February 17th, 2019. Tiny, incremental, and frictionless. This Week in Tech is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Protect your online activity today for an extra three months free with a one-year package. Go to expressvpn.com slash twit. And by Wasabi Hot Cloud Storage. From the founders of Carbonite comes the cloud storage technology that's disrupting the industry. See for yourself with free unlimited storage for a month. Go to wasabi.com, click free trial, and use the offer code TWIT. And by Thousand Eyes. Companies that run in the cloud rely on Thousand Eyes. It's the place they go to first to see, understand, and improve the digital experience of their cloud-based applications and services. Do the cloud right and improve services for your customers and employees today. Visit thousandeyes.com slash TWIT. And by Aura Ring, the most accurate sleep and activity tracker. Visit AuraRing.com and use the code TWIT for $50 off your purchase. It's time for TWIT This Week at Tech, the show where we cover the week's tech news with a fantastic panel. Lindsay Turntine is here. She is editor-in-chief of, of uh, I almost said the wrong word, of CNET. Dot com, not the other word, CNET.com. Hi, Lindsay. Hi. Hi. I, I actually just changed jobs. I'm running all the tech sites for CBSI. Oh, we got a quick fix the just, lower I just third. I forgot to tell you. What, it, what is your title? It's VP of tech sites. Holy cow. CBSI. She's a CBS vice president, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> With Les Moonves gone, the sky's the limit. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> She's in charge of all the tech. And I'm in charge of all the content on the tech sites mm -hmm. at CBSI. Is there a distinction? Between, Between CNET and all the tech sites? Yeah. Sure. There's CNET, ZDNet, Tech, Re tech Republic. You're in charge Show. of ZDNet too? Yeah. Holy, Tech Republic. So you're Jason Heiner's real boss now. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. It couldn't happen to a nicer person. Thank you. So happy for you. That's Thank wonderful. You. <laughs> also here, Schmeiser, Lisa yeah. Schmeiser. Hello. She's a Windows Enterprise side, editor IT Pro today. Yes. yes. And. I'm actually no longer with Windows Secrets. We handed the site off to Woody Lenhard. So he is steering that ship He now. started it, didn't he? he yes. Way back when. It's a very, it's circle of life. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, I'm just nice. doubling down on the enterprise coverage. And mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, anybody else want to announce job changes here while we're at? <laughs> <laughs> did Sam Mashkovich, did you get promoted or are you still at Ars Technica in charge of culture? I'm still over at uh, Ars Technica in charge of culture, but sometimes I come onto twit.tv and hang out with some really nice folks. Yeah, we love Sam. And they Sam. don't even offer me any whiskey in exchange. We so. adore Sam. You might have seen him one and Jason Howell. One know day how. the technology will be there. We encourage oh. you to supply your own whiskey yeah. And, yeah. and sip with us, however. Or it'll be like the end of William Gibson's All Tomorrow's Parties where you have the right printer and next thing you know, you just yes. enter in the thing and out yes, comes the product. Outcome, yes. Mm-hmm. Ooh, I don't know about that. That sounds like fun. Yeah. That's the future, though, right? That is the future. Yeah, okay. I'm just checking. <laughs> Sometimes, well, the future's here, as he said. The future's here. Just it's not, not evenly, evenly distributed. distributed. And yeah. I thought maybe William had a kind of, <laughs> like, kind of an insight to, inside. So yeah. Sam has a pile of tech culture sitting behind him, and I think it's mm -hmm. going to be part of the game during the show today to see whether it falls on his head. No. Whoa. It's, I hope not. This is centimeters away. The perspective is definitely. <laughs> centimeters if away. If he gets bonked oh, by wow. Starry Starry Night. <laughs> we'll There's know. no earthquakes. Where that's you actually live, if you, if, it's hard to see in the camera, but that is a eight-bit Super Mario Starry Night. Oh, that's amazing! You can kind of make out level one one of Super Mario Brothers on it. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah. I don't even know what to say. Oh, I did wow. not paint it. <laughs> I do not even. Know. You don't live any place that's earthquake prone, do you? Uh, Seattle. Oh, oh no! Oh. Were you in? <laughs> <Thanks. laughs> Thanks, you just did that. We're, we've were been so, waiting so for someone to, to pull you, out the jinx. You were, did it. Thanks. Were you in Snowpocalypse earlier? It, yeah, earlier. Now it's melt. Melt apocalypse. Mud apocalypse from the melting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so Seattle. That's. I think there's a couple of big companies there. Uh, Boeing mm -hmm. is one, and Amazon 
is another. Amazon uh, apparently not totally beloved in Seattle. What is the overall climate for for Amazon in Seattle? I really look forward to seeing these little uh, drone trash cans start rolling around in our city. <laughs> You're going to get them. And seeing how our, our citizens react to them. Uh, there is a, a, a spheres in the middle of downtown Seattle in the South Lake Union neighborhood where Amazon has a lot of buildings already. Uh, the spheres being this Amazon-leaning biosphere concept where there are plants and meeting rooms and coffee. And citizens call those Bezos's balls. That's, that's what they're called. <laughs> Bezos's balls, which it takes a lot to say. So, and you he, know. he plunks them down in the middle of some of the most prime real estate in all of the city. That's... It's that's kind of how to so, sum that up. Wow. Of course, rents are higher now because of all those Amazon people, right? And property values. Do you ever feel like you're just you're all just guinea pigs for Amazon, like but didn't just kind of accept it because it's been uh, so long? Mm -hmm. I mean, I helped participate in the guinea pigging of their um, gig economy flex driver service, where when you live in a prime now city, mm -hmm. there are people who get paid uh, seventeen bucks an hour, give or take, to wear and tear their own cars and deliver your dog food. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. We now but have, they, uh, they, they've, they I think that they, they were doing that uh, here, but now they look like they're all prime vans. Yeah. I'm yeah. sure they're still gig economy drivers. I had somebody deliver something the other day and I, it really looked like she it's just got out of her Camry. It's weird when they pull up Camry. in a Corolla. Yeah, yeah. It's really weird. It's some unmarked vehicle. Yeah. This happened to me last person. week. So I've gotten to know my driver though. She's really cute. Oh. She's fun. Yeah. And, Actually, uh, you know each other. Okay. And she, yeah. she works hard and I think she's supporting some kids and, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I'm glad that they got her a van. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I got, I got curious about car sales for 2018 just because I wanted to see if they're trending up or trending down. And what one of the things that happened in the past year is more people bought SUVs and minivans. But that's what, been happening every year for the last decade. Well, no, this it? was no, this is actually no, it was it's, it's actually going it was up. a little bit of a flip. It's good news for the car companies because it's higher margins. But what I was wondering is if people are buying these cars because they see them as investments in the gig economy. Yeah. Mm. Since if you can carry more passengers or more cargo. Yeah then you that's can why, go work for Amazon why, or Lyft. Sure. Or that's why we bought an Audi 8L so I can, uh, A8L so I can uh, drive a little uh, Uber and Lyft in my spare yeah. time. And I think it's nice. People like the comfort in the back. It's mm -hmm. lots of leg room. And I, I, I've been mostly a positive. Mm -hmm. Tipping's still a problem. The uh, mm -hmm. only reason I bring this up is because Amazon is not going to be in Long Island City <laughs> yeah. after all. Uh, yeah. This is, this, so... I don't know. What do you what do you think? It seems a little like I'm taking my ball and going home. In fact, I think that's what Mayor Blasio <coughs> said mm. on Meet the Press today. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like Amazon was like, oh, okay. Uh, this whole past year of them posturing about this seemed like much ado about nothing. There was a huge search oh, was a for great HQ2. data, but it was a great data collection. They got information about they got, all these they got cities. Everybody under yes. NDA, they have all of this information that their competitors do not have. They can now use that. But what? The and they also know what cities are willing to do to have them there. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Well, and, and that's, it, of course, the issue at hand was that there were $3 billion in tax incentives. Yeah. That doesn't mean money they were giving to Amazon. It means that they would pay that much less in taxes exactly. over a period of but, time. But, you know, the, the timing for this was especially, um, I don't want to say unfortunate, but it, it felt a little tone deaf because we've seen such a stratification of economies and jobs. And so for Amazon to come in and say, guess what? We're bringing these jobs in. 25, you probably jobs. won't be able to get one of these jobs. And oh. you also probably will not be able to afford your rent once we're done. Yeah, so we're going to push. That That's yeah. what happened in, in uh, Seattle, right? And we this pushed you out. Thing, and this has been percolating through New York for the past decade, too, where there's been a growing sense that people are getting pushed out thanks to the influx yeah. of money. That's sure. washing through the global economy. And so you had a lot of people who were like, wait a minute, this isn't my city anymore. And you've given it to a corporation that's not going to give us anything in return. So I sort of wondered if New York actually was too much of, of there was too much employer competition for Amazon. And then the end mm -hmm. in New York, it's pretty easy to take a job with one of a bazillion large yeah. corporations. Amazon couldn't be king in yeah. that setting. Virginia, maybe a little bit more, especially with so many former government workers yep. not cycling back into government work yep. right now. Yeah, and that's the thing about the, the places they picked, New York and D.C. They, they picked those because they wanted to hold some finance and retail up in New York, and then they wanted to government. make sure that they could provision the government with the rest of the federal contractors inside the Beltway. And that's and, and in Virginia, that's just the cost of doing business as far as everybody's concerned. Northern Virginia is the US. other HQ2 that they are going ahead in with. In the erstwhile Crystal City, I believe it's being renamed. Um, I cannot remember what they're calling it, but when I was 
finishing high school in that area, the development was called Crystal City. Hmm. And hmm. it's right next to National Airport. It's on, so it's on at least one major metro line, the blue. It's really close to the Pentagon. And thanks to security regulations and things like that, if you're going to service those contracts, it helps to have people on the ground there. Amazon says that's going to proceed as uh, planned. Yeah. You said the jobs would not go to New Yorkers, the 25,000 jobs? Who would they go to? They're going to go to college graduates or they're going to go to high-skilled tech people. They're too who skilled. Are, well, yeah, they're going to go to high-skilled tech people who would otherwise be working in the Bay Area or in Seattle right. or in D.C. or in Austin or possibly Atlanta. So it's a gentrification tech. of Long Island City yeah. that the residents mm -hmm. didn't seem to want. Yeah. The governor wanted it. The mayor wanted it. Uh, but uh, there was ground... Uh, groundswell of, yeah, of opposition. a lot of civic resistance. But it feels like Amazon was a little bit of a snowflake here. Like they said, oh, you don't like it? Okay, fine, we'll leave. Yeah. Couldn't they take a little heat? I felt maybe they overplayed their hand. I don't know. They did. I mean, yeah. by choosing two cities in the first place, they yeah. spread themselves out. I mean, we all thought it was going to be one, and then yeah. it was two, and then they... Three, actually, because they're also building that 5,000-person center in... Is that Austin? Memphis. 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 Because Tennessee, between Memphis and Knoxville, those are ground zero for uh, FedEx is there. I believe UPS is a pretty big outpost there. That's where you have a lot of logistics um, talent. And so if Amazon's going to double down on that part of their market, they're going to want to be where the aggregation of talent is. And... Um, Pretty soon, everything's going to be owned by Amazon. I mean, mm. what is what yeah, Nash it? Nashville is, and Nashville's becoming a huge draw for college graduates. So that's another place where you're going to, it'll be easy to aggregate talent and to poach it from other companies because mm -hmm. there's not that much difference between the cities in Tennessee. So you used to work at FedEx, meh, move to Nashville where Amazon's going to be. So I'm just curious, Sam, because you live in Amazon town. Mm hmm yeah, I have context to offer. I did work for them for four months. That's a Googleable story. Readers, feel free to type my last name in Billy Ray Cyrus. It's a long, funny tale. <laughs> uh, that was back in, yeah, 2007. But having you still have an achy, breaky heart after those years? It's a great story, I promise you. <laughs> but uh, the thing is, this is a company that has proven in its time in, the, in Washington State to not contribute much more mm. than the bare minimum. Yeah. Uh, in terms of one of the biggest stories that came out of the past year in Seattle was a huge push, an organic push from some of the really, really radically left-leaning city council members for a head tax that basically established oh, right. a certain amount of more tax for companies in Seattle who make certain amount of money per year and have a certain number of employees per year. We're a regressive state. We don't have state income tax. Seattle has a tax shortfall all of the time. Amazon was one of the prime leaders in terms of funneling money into opposition groups, doing it in such a way that journalists had to dig up and find that that was the case. Isn't there a, a, a Seattle city tax on people making more than 250000 a year, or, is, or am I mistaken? I'm not, I can't help you with the entire tax code, so yeah. sure. Um, but I, that was, can you help? But, but can you help me, Sam? I've done my taxes yet. <laughs> oh yeah, we need Sam to do our taxes. You mean Cyrus yeah. will talk about it. Yeah. But it's <laughs> a company known for a lack of general giving back, either in arts or in city and state value. Yeah. in that way. And then also the hiring does tend to just bring in a lot of people from out of state mm -hmm. who are, the, the pattern tends to be buy up in the middle of the city, disrupt and then leave. Yeah. It's a lot of people who come in for two, three, four years, cash out, get burnt out and get the heck out. And the result has been, it's a hard thing to write about. The Stranger was my former employer here in Seattle, an oh, all-weekly paper. The and they have chronicled at length a lot of the sort of cultural and human cost that comes with Amazon. So I think there's a lot of that that gets lost in the headlines when a city like New York says, mm -hmm. what is this employer going to do? What are they going to do with their money? And what's the cultural impact going to be? So that's been the biggest thing I've noticed. I've been here only 12 years. I'm also sort of a transient. But when I moved here, I could afford to live on $11,000 a year scrapping by. And that Seattle is no longer no. anywhere in that no. kind of place. No. So the city Sam, I have a quick question. How, because um, you've got Amazon, Microsoft used to be the big tech gorilla in the area. How are Microsofties perceived in Seattle relative to Amazon people? I think there's a perception more of philanthropy and more of spreading out. There's also the the bridge culture, like the east siders. If you go east of Seattle, you end up in towns like Bellevue and Redmond, where Microsoft has a lot of campuses. Yeah. So I think that, to some extent, sort of changed it. It was a lot of local engineer culture people, uh, mostly because Boeing had been here sort of establishing that culture for decades. So it wasn't, you know, there are lots of international hires that came in as a result to diversify the technological culture within uh Microsoft, which I think is good. But then the, Microsoft has generally been more on the up and up and giving money to University of Washington, giving money to city and state initiatives. 
uh, it, the perception is generally, yeah, there's an economic impact that's both good and bad. And Amazon has been perceived as a lot less balanced. Well, that was my other question was if there was a really tight tie between UW and Microsoft and that helped foster a feeling of being better integrated into the Seattle as a community sure. than maybe Amazon has. I remember I a college are, boyfriend of mine got recruited or was, you know, he, he didn't end up going, um, but he was recruited by Microsoft out of yeah. school in Boston. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of that going on, but I think that it was Cambridge, kind of it's new. Okay. I don't want Cambridge you to hold back. at Harvard. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> I often say I went to school Harvard. in Connecticut for the same reason. It's just but you, you just you're like, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> but, um, but they did recruit at the time in the '90s, mm -hmm. a very long time ago. Yeah. They did recruit people from out of state heavily. It was the same thing: college yeah. graduates from out of state. But I think that it was there, the boom hadn't quite is happened it, yet in Seattle, so it, it didn't yeah. seem bad. Is it a culture for clash? Yeah. Is it that these uh, San Francisco complains all the time? And part of it's money. Part of it's you just being forced out. The rents are too high. You can't yeah. buy a house. But also part of it's culture. Like you don't want a monoculture. San Francisco, which used to be this great diverse city, has become a monoculture. Yeah, really. <laughs> it's so boring now. It's boring. <laughs> It is, and you go out uh, in San Francisco to a bar or to a restaurant. Mm -hmm. We went to that Tech TV reunion. Mike rem remembers mm -hmm. that, and uh, yeah. there was just a bunch of yuppies from startups around, and they were. It was cold, so they were wearing blankets. The bar provided them with blankets, and it just seemed like a. <laughs> there was a. It was like go home. This is San Francisco. <laughs> Get rid I mean, of the blanket. <laughs> the hiring that happens at companies like Amazon, I think, drives a cultural glut where you have folks yeah. who are 29 to 35 who have a ton of money, who are yeah. primarily male, and they've got a lot of money and they're hitting up these condos in the middle of the city. So it's like expensive addictions to whiskey. That's sort of the culture I've, I've perceived from my uh, friends who date around Seattle and they flip through apps and it's just boring uh, guys who think having whiskey and going hiking once a month is their personality. I don't it's, know uh, what um, you're talking I about, go hiking Sam. At least once a month. I, uh, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Were you talking? <laughs> I'm used yeah. to this in Seattle. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I mean, as long as we're piling on, mm -hmm. the story came out this week also that Amazon, despite making gobs of money, uh, $11.2 billion in 2018, all, double what they made the year before, paid zero, zero mm -hmm. in federal in zero in federal income taxes. Uh, that's, of course, because they have losses, right, that offset yeah. the taxes. This is the law. They're not breaking the law. They're not stealing. But at the same time, it's the same kind of sense of you're, you're taking... You've built a business, an incredibly profitable business. Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world, Amazon at one point worth more than a trillion dollars, and you're not giving back. Mm -hmm. It is very. I I always try to look for the silver lining when I think about Be Bezos. He's always gone for the long game, mm -hmm. very long game. I'm hoping one day he wakes up and he pulls a pulls a Bill Gates and is like, "All right, time to put all of this back." And, I but yeah. I have seen nothing. I, Gates did I do that, right? He didn't yeah. do anything. He didn't do anything for, remember? Yeah. We would talk about this all of the time about yeah. 15 years ago. It was and then, like, and now he's he like doesn't give, Bill he doesn't Gates. give, he doesn't he's give. Like, he's yeah. woke. And now he's woke Bill Gates where he just, there was an interview I was reading in the Los Angeles Times this morning where he and Melinda were saying, look, they're, they're, they're talking about there's a nationalist case to be made for globalism because it right. can boost economies. Data is inherently gender biased. So we need to find ways to eliminate that. You're education. talking about the letter that, that he and Melinda sent out. Exactly. Yeah. And like, this is a thing he does now. This is this is also the dude who released a bunch of live mosquitoes in Davos. Yeah. All. But remember, Andrew Here's Carnegie built a lot of libraries, too. I mean, and there's a, a good I think as you get older, you start to fear death, mortality. Well, I, I don't think Bezos will. I think he may end up either like funding a massive cryogenics effort. So he's like a head in a jar. <laughs> he's not like going to die. Drama, That's the problem. Or he's going to like. Like, we're going to discover he's been building a moon base. Sure, and, but he has also know, been yeah. investing heavily in journalism. Yeah. To his good. credit. It's Washington, Washington Post. Post. Yeah. I mean, Thank he's you. been pouring yeah. money into it, Thank and they you. have been yeah. growing quickly and doing very really good, good work. work. And in fact, yeah. they were the ones to report this this morning. Yeah. Or yesterday. No, they did. To <laughs> report this tax <laughs> right. issue. Isn't it interesting? interesting. But on the well, other hand, I also feel like... To the credit of both the Washington Post and Jeff Bezos, because he example, wants it to be profitable, though he's not investing in the Washington Post. But you contrast that, for example, deficit. Buzzfeed had that series of high-profile layoffs, and I kept checking the site to see how they were covering their own story because it yeah. was a story. They didn't cover it. They didn't have anything until after they were able to unionize, and then they finally ran it as a news story. Yeah. And so I'd I'd say that Washington Post is doing a lot of things right, whether or not Bezos is a hands-off leader or I have heard that steers. he is hands-off. 
that he's in totally hands off other yeah. than the business part of it. That but, he's yeah. not he has not been sticking his nose into the journalism. Yeah. But you contrast that with something like again how BuzzFeed didn't cover its layoffs, which were a huge story. Sure. And I think a lot of the people who would have covered the layoffs got laid off. <laughs> I'm not joking. I think no. that actually is They what really happened. yeah, they decimated the news desk. Uh, it was rough. It was We'd cover it, but nobody's left. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Uh, all right. I, I just, uh, you know, this is kind of the tenor of the year and, and, and also somewhat of the uh, second half of 2018 was yeah. the big five. Fog. Uh, fa <laughs> the fangs are uh, yeah. too big and too irresponsible. Mm. And we've got to do something about Facebook, Amazon, um, Microsoft. Hey, remember when Microsoft got busted for antitrust just for bundling our browser with their operating system? Oh, we were talking about that the other day. Yeah. Right. Do you remember that? Yes. Yeah, it was. That was misguided, century, though. Remember? That was misguided. But it went just, on for yeah. years. Uh -huh. It ended up in Europe with the ballot, uh, browser ballot, where, where you installed Windows for the first time and said, well, mm -hmm. which browser would you like to use? Mm -hmm. Which was a dopey solution. Mm -hmm. It didn't change anything. So that was misguided. Oh, I don't necessarily think it was guided no. i just think that it was you look at the metric then. but you look yeah. at the bar that they had to you look at the bar that was set for is this an antitrust case or not and then you contrast that nowadays with the no. way companies yeah. are operating and yeah. you have to ask They're, yourself why why are we not seeing well europe's any, still going after these guys europe is yeah and google recently released guidance saying our profits are likely to get hit thanks to gdpr and increased and, incre sure. and, and increased fines. regulation because <laughs> it's going to affect how much information we can gather yeah. and then monetize. I think that's true for almost yeah. any oh, yeah. major international company is being affected by GDPR. Well, the thing I'm going to be wondering about is how are they going to lean on American users and consumers to make up the profit shortfall? Because we have we, we don't have those protections, so we are we are basically sitting ducks as users. Oh, you to think it's speaking. we're going to end up paying the fines, basically? Yeah. yeah. Well, at least Amazon bought Euro. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> yeah I did. Huh. Okay. I know a lot anything, of people who are not very happy about that. Anything to say about people work at Eero? Mm -hmm. I, I, no. I think that this, I, I can't quite see how it's going to come together yet, but I have an Eero router and I, I have all this, I have all the So I should disclaim Eero is a sponsor Yeah. and I too have an Eero router. Uh, I love my Eero. I love mine too. It's new. Uh, I'm enjoying it. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot of potential for... Amazon's digital assistant to get much better. And this may be a way to s put legs into sensing what else is going on in the home in a more sophisticated way than oh, Amazon's the upside currently is, able to do. For the, the upside well, is the clear. Ups the upside for them is clear. But, sure. but, but isn't it also concerning? I mean, this is more of that the nothing same. nothing is neutral anymore? Well, your Once Eero knows, as you know, system, if you look you at the Eero app, out. it knows every single device that's in your house. Mm -hmm. Sure. Exactly. And yep. how much you use it. When it's on, when it's off, when you're home because you join the router, when you leave, yep. uh, and Amazon will have all that data. You know, you know why Amazon wants that because Google is at this point I neck and neck with Amazon in terms of fingers into the smart home. Yeah. yeah, Google already knows everything about you. That's true. Google knows all that stuff, and Amazon is at a disadvantage. And it's kind of too bad that both of these platforms know this much about you. But mm -hmm. that is why Amazon's doing it. They well, need my to know as much as Google does. Yeah. My Amazon birdies tell me basically that just the amount of money that Echo devices drives means there are so many different teams that are all battling to pitch and make whatever the next thing is, meaning there's just skunk works going on for all kinds of different stuff. And we saw a hint of that at an event last year where they unveiled the Amazon Echo wall clock and the Amazon Echo microwave. By the way, the like, clock was just recalled this week. They stopped yeah, making it. Mm -hmm. it wasn't I think what I'd actually keep an eye on too is the Amazon small business bundle where you set up your, your, your mesh wireless network plus some voice activated speakers. And it's things like schedule this client meeting, send out this email at this time, and you help people automate small home offices. Sam, do you think And then that you the tie them into the Amazon cloud that way because the cloud can host everything. And this is how they build out their non-retail customer and keep them that way is by tying into the And compete the with area. Google, which yeah. is think, already- Sam, the Euro so acquisition has to do with Echo? You think yeah. that that's- Absolutely, 100%. Extending the Echo ecosystem? Meaning that there's the, the purse strings are totally open. So if anybody on that team says, we're gonna create the total perfect thing, we wanna be able to ship somebody something in a box via amazon.com, uh, everything that they need to continue to do all the stuff that gets promoted, even if that ends up polluting and diluting this pool of IoT nonsense, 
and make, in my opinion, makes it more complicated. They, everyone still wants to be the one stop and mm -hmm. they're getting closer and closer with how many people bought up those dots. Dot <sighs> sales absolutely ha set Amazon on a five-year path mm -hmm. of just capitalizing on that I while have, they have that. I have that echoes in every room right. of my house. And I have Eros I, in, in many of the rooms yeah, of my house. Yeah. I cannot believe you do that. That's insane. That's yeah, so much data you're I don't have any smart home devices about. activated in my really? house. Yeah. Really? I shouldn't oh. have because, those? Because, well, I also look, have Google Homes. And, uh, with the, with the, I even the, have a, a Cortana in my living room. With, with, with the caveat, it's, <laughs> a pers an it's a personal decision. Yeah. Okay. You know, personal decision yeah. and all that. But but maybe I'm uninformed. None of the Fong, Fong companies <laughs> um, are forthcoming with what they're collecting, yeah. when, the, when, when they're recording and when they're not how that data is secured, yeah. how it's tied to your ID or not to your, uh, tied to your ID, how it's bundled, who it's sold to. How what are they going to do with this data? They don't give you the What are you worried about that they're going to do? They market gonna, you yeah. in ways that you yeah. don't necessarily so, want. Yeah, I think what, if my echo, what if my Echo yeah. one day says, oh, hi, Leo, I see that you've one of your Hue lights is burned out. Would you like to buy another one? Mm -hmm. Oh, That's, I mean, they're already on that way. They is that a bad one. thing, yeah. though? Not necessarily. I mean, there are, but there are other privacy implications when it comes to well, like what? law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Well, basically the best, the most revealing stuff is when you see these subpoenas that get sent yeah, to Amazon. I'm that, carrying or, or, a, I carry my pocket and you- onto a ton of data. Yeah, I, I mean, would submit you all carry in your pocket a, a, a microphone and a camera that's always absolutely. connected to the internet. So mm -hmm. honestly, does it really matter that I also have a microphone in my living room? Yes. I think it's, it's, it's the TOS that you sign when you install that Amazon device. That is what's scarier. I mean, well, with my- Cell phone. I do everything I can to lock down microphone and camera access. And Lord you knows how. You are so rare, that though, Sam. I think that for ninety-eight exactly. percent of people, yeah. Leo's point is absolutely yeah. apt. Like it, it's you're being heard anyway. There's you're being heard anyway. It is and you almost think, inescapable. Yeah. But it's well, and, when you, and the reason I bring this up about, is when you talk about law law enforcement. Law enforcement is not going to subpoena my Echo, or maybe they are because they have it, but they more, well, most likely they're going to go after my phone. They I guess what I mean is that the subpoenas sort of indicate how much wealth of data they have. Mm -hmm. But again, you mentioned GDPR. How do they make up? for that data shortfall. Mm -hmm. I mean, once you have as much data as Amazon has about your shopping habits, about your geolocation, depending on the app you have installed, about when you talk to your phone or when you talk to your Echoes, these are, they want, the, the more of these triangulation points they have, the further they go. And that doesn't mean it's gonna necessarily be anti-consumer or terrible or dystopian, but it's just a whole giant world out there of how crazy, weird, bad, and penetrative this stuff can be mm -hmm. in ways we don't know. And then once every nine months, we see a story from a company like Facebook that says, whoopsie, some of that data went away in a well, way we didn't mean. Sorry I, about I that. I agree. It's no big deal, though. Facebook pays fast and loose, plays fast and loose with that data. I don't mm -hmm. have a Facebook account anymore because of that. Uh, that I agree with. But also, I don't need a Facebook account, and I never gain anything of real value from it. Mm. But if my Amazon uh, spot can say, hey, I noticed your whiskey bottle's a little low. Would you like me to order another one? That's valuable. It is valuable unless, uh, here's the, the counter argument. I tend to agree with you and I've got, if, I will, or at least I'm very fatalistic about it. Like mm -hmm. this ship has sailed. I can tell that, I, that <laughs> my data sailed, has been triangulated so up. many times. You think we should give up? No, I don't think we should give up. That doesn't mean I haven't given up. But in any case. <laughs> I've given up, but <laughs> that's my job. I think that the, there's an opportunity cost that comes into play here. So you, Amazon may say, hey, your yeah. whiskey's out. Do you want to order? More, you may say, oh, yeah, sure. But the reality is there might be another whiskey out there that you like more, mm -hmm. that costs less, that you're not looking for because Amazon made it too convenient for you. And that's a cost that I think is a real consumer mm -hmm. cost that we're all going to start to feel over time. We are already seeing that because there have been research reports published where it's Amazon already waits search results so that their choices for you based on your buying history and based on cost per unit are weighted higher than what might actually be oh, the yeah, best we saw consumer that. value. That's right. You may not so, get the lowest price because you spend more money. So yeah. we're going to give you a, exactly. in fact, algorithmically, we might even bump the price before we serve you the page. Exactly. So you have yeah. that. Again, it comes That's down to- That's a little scary. I yeah, have to admit. I really, and that is a, yeah. real co a literal cost. Yes. That's a cost. And there's another thing to consider. And this was actually a piece that Heather Kelly wrote for CNN this past week, which is if all of these companies are making money off of the data that you're generating, why aren't you getting a cut? It's your data. It's your product. Why are they yeah, but, repackaging but, but, you and selling you work? back to you? I just want them to pay federal taxes. How yeah. would it work to give me a cut of my information? I mean, there are moves, but like I feel like they're—I I feel I, like yeah. they're tilting at windmills. I feel yeah. like they're quixotic. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee, the creator of the World Wide Web, has mm -hmm. a company that he's started that will somehow 
magically take all your personal data, lock it away, and then mm -hmm. dole it out to the companies for payment. I don't, I don't see that ever yeah. happening or working. I want somebody to sell me a TV for $200. That's what I want. Yeah, but what kind of TV would you get for $200? Does it, a, TV <laughs> very nice, that, a TV very nice, that watches me. A very ah, nice TCL yeah. TV that's made in China, as a matter of fact. Mm. They're surprisingly inexpensive. Oh, they're so inexpensive. And, and they track everything where... that you watch and do. So what? I don't care. There were it, well, there, there were what Japanese... do I care if the Chinese know I watch the Umbrella Academy? What does that matter? <laughs> Seriously. This is when you start getting the advertisements. If you like this comic, then you'll Look, like that one. We're already yeah. getting advertisements yeah. on every possible surface. I mean, I would my... rather have advertisements about stuff at least I'm interested mm -hmm. in buying. What's actually interesting, I'm a KQED um, supporter, and I got a PIN code for a pledge free stream during this last pledge. Oh, drive. hallelujah, finally. Because if you donate a certain amount, then they'll give you a I pin, and you don't have to hear those but, poor guys going, and we'll give you the Aton hand. Just out of curiosity. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Who sponsors Masterpiece Theater? Viking Cruises. You know why? I know that because they play a goddamn ad ah. on this ad-free service every time <laughs> you watch the show. It's like you've got me. I'm just watching Rick Steves. I don't know who's Yes, yeah, see, that's the thing. Rick Steves, I bet he has. So public television and radio, and I don't, I don't fault yeah. them. They still make great content, mm -hmm. but they're not ad-free. No. They're no longer ad-free. And pledges, just those are the worst. Thank God they're giving you a chance. That's because they get no public support anymore besides I know. from individual I know. users. I there understand that no they have to do it. Yeah. I know that they have to do it. Uh, look, you're going to see ads mm -hmm. no matter what you do, yeah. right? Unless you, I don't know, if you get offline and you don't watch TV. I, this is a little bit of a slight change of subject or a shift slightly to the left. Mm -hmm. I will say the upside of all this triangulation is that the ads I get, mm -hmm. are better. especially on Instagram. Oh, they're too good. <laughs> I stopped. I stopped Instagram. I just I spend too much money. I'm, I'm wearing like, Instagram like underwear right now. I had me? to stop. Instagram underwear. I had to stop. <laughs> yeah. I would wake up at three in the morning and buy stuff. Right? It's, yes. And They're that's why good. the Instagram app is genius because people are mm -hmm. like, this is actually fun. I, there is an app. You know, they have now have the shopping app. Mm -hmm. And people. They do. Yeah. There's a separate Instagram shopping app. Because <laughs> people, people like it, it so much. It. It's so effective. I mean, so <sighs> so there's that. That's the upside. And I you buy more why things. U.S. consumer debt has hit new highs. You know, in a way, <laughs> this is a digital divide, the haves yeah. and the have-nots, because yeah. people can afford to, can pay for a ad-free or less ad experience. Which is what I do, to be you honest. You pay for it. I do. Well, and it was interesting because we stream almost all of our media at this point. Oh. And when we were watching live TV for some, we were watching the Super Bowl. That's what we were watching. Um, and the ads came on, and all of us were just kind of transfixed. Just, oh. Uh, I've never seen an I ad. I hate well, ads. No, well, I hate ads on we're, TV. We're like I... soft and vulnerable exactly. now from not, Look, not being exposed ad. constantly. But it's, Ars Technica. Must, it takes a lot. I yeah, pay for Ars, Ars Technica for the yeah. same reason. We, we not only, uh, sorry to interrupt, not only do we block ads, but we also, when you pay for it, we also block all the trackers, meaning all that activity that yep. you don't necessarily want companies calling. I have a very long answer to why we should care about that, but otherwise the show would go on to seven hours. No, let's hours hear it. Why should minutes. we care about it? The shortest answer, in my opinion, is that tech companies are building to total automation, total machine learning, and they're going to go in directions that we cannot even predict that may really benefit from some sort of government surveillance and want to do everything they can to line all of that up one piece at a time until larger companies can take control of our day-to-day -day lives and profit off of it in that same way when we're just saying, why am I not getting money for giving Amazon these little bits of data? I think that's going to go up to a thousand to a million percent more mm -hmm. because of the kind of cobbling of data and what that leads to for the few giant companies who have all of that in their servers and all of us who do not. You, you're exactly right. It's exactly why they will not be regulated out of this because mm -hmm. ultimately in this post 9-11 world, governments want this kind of information. And so they're very happy to let these guys continue to do what they do. And there's uh, plenty of sci-fi out there about giant corporations running things. I mean, yeah. I, oh my God, is Shadowgate is the one that's based in Seattle? It's a pen and paper RPG where it's corporations, not governments. I mean, mm -hmm. you no, know, William we Gibson, got, like, Neuromancer. That's the the world of Neuromancer is run by corporations, right? The, yeah, and if you look at the Blue Ant trilogy, that's the other thing he's positing is that corporations are effectively setting cultural agendas. And this is so. I interviewed, and I've mentioned it several times, but it's new to you guys, so. <laughs> I'll say it again. Susanna Zoboff, Shoshana, Shoshana Zoboff's new book is mm -hmm. Surveillance Capitalism. Excellent. Highly recommended. And that's exactly what she's concerned about. Mm -hmm. Is not. It's not, you know, initially we made the deal with the devil because we got free services in, re in, in return for ads. Mm -hmm. Eventually mm -hmm. we got free services 
and tracking in return for targeted ads. And even at that point, I don't have so much of a problem with it. The next step is sort of what Instagram's doing, which is predicting behavior. It's an excellent book, predicting behavior. And then final step is influencing behavior. And I think we're rapidly moving to that point where uh, they convince you to do something, to buy something, to behave a way, to to vote a certain way. Oh, sure. Uh, using these these. Well, you uh, look techniques. at how corporations have taken political stances at this point. It's because they've been able to commodify people's impulses and philosophies. Right. And, or they, at yeah. the very least, look at the last elections, enable, yeah. mm -hmm. enable shaping our behavior. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, and that is obvious, yeah. that our yeah. behavior is shaped by the bubbles we place ourselves in mm -hmm. and then what we allow... Yeah, what we I, allow to be kept out. Facebook yeah. will pay lip service to this, but they don't really... Yeah. You know, they're dealing right now with this issue of whether they allow vaxxers to continue to post on Facebook. This anti a anti topic, yeah. I think. Uh, and this is a tough one for Facebook because... Public health versus free speech. Yeah. yeah. Direct opposition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I don't think Facebook wants to ban anything because... It's honest, not in their best interest. It's not in their best interest. Yeah. It's not in their corporate interest. So they're walking this very fine line. They're afraid of government regulation. I agree with you, Sam. It's highly unlikely because there is a very tight partnership between the data gatherers and the panopticon uh, in the government that wants to see everything. Um, so maybe they don't need to worry about it. They also are worried about public opinion. And clearly, a yeah. lot of what Facebook does is to try to assuage public opinion. Yeah. They have they made a decision yet on this anti-vax uh, issue? Uh, I think they decide. I think they did ban a few anti-vax uh, groups. The problem is the anti-vax groups are now spreading information among each other as to how to circumvent the conversation. God, if only there was a vaccine to stop this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a really interesting problem, and uh, it's just one of a million of these because mm -hmm. it's not. I mean, and 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 society itself doesn't agree on what to do about this. I don't think Facebook has finally decided yet. It is definitely a public health concern. We're having measles out outbreaks in Seattle, I think, yeah. and in, yep. in Texas. And, in, and Kids it's, are, it's children, pretty... babies are dying. Well, here's a question. Historically speaking, has Facebook ever engaged with a social issue proactively, or has it usually been in reaction to negative press or negative I think sentiment? they have. Their emergency uh, uh, system, right, where uh -huh. you're in a disaster. Sure. Yeah. 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 I think mm -hmm. that they didn't. They didn't do that in response to anybody. They just thought, oh, this is a good idea. Are you sure it wasn't a way for them to gather data? So that they no, seriously. <laughs> you're so yeah. paranoid. I'm not paranoid. Mark that I you're think safe. Mark Facebook that you're here. exists to gather data, repackage it, and monetize it. So if they roll out a system where people self check in after a disaster, how do you think that, how do you, what do you think that they could but sell later? They're think sitting there evilly. Yeah, in no, their I don't think anyone's think that doing that it evilly. Happens. I'm thinking it I think that, yeah. that what happens is that there is an actually legitimately positive human. Yeah intention yeah. Mm -hmm. and then over that gets used and they, then there's a meeting where you say let's talk about the successes of this program they quantify the successes yep. and somebody in that meeting says hey this could help us meet our goals yes let's, let's try let's it's, try to use this as a target it's not nefarious it's not malicious no it's not malicious I, it's merely i it's merely hey this serves our company's needs and there's not an, in, an incentive to put it into a that's bigger context. the problem and I think Zuboff brings this up. Uh -huh. It's kind of happening in just the natural course of events. It yeah. doesn't take evil people no. to no. create this. It just happens. And this is the concern I with having a few extremely large companies in charge of pretty much everything we do. It's that I think I think what happens is that very rarely, although it's possible that there is a, a that there is a malicious leader in charge of those companies, it's really more that human behaviors get amplified in any system. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And human behaviors are self-serving. We're seeing that happen. Technology well, you're also is an talking about how people stay in their bubbles. And I have lost track of the number of B2B conferences I've gone to where I sit in rooms with really smart people who are really devoted to the projects they do. And they say things excitedly like, once the system's in place, we'll be able to eliminate 70% of shipping jobs and keep cargo more secure. And when I ask, well, what happens to the people who used to work in shipping? They say very excitedly, they're free to do more imaginative and creative work. <laughs> and that's what I'm thinking. That is what you would like to do if you were freed from your current job. <laughs> but you cannot right. presume that everybody approaches work the same way you do and gets the same thing out of it. Well, and, and everybody would like to do that, yeah. but, it's, but we so far haven't found a way to make creative work yeah. more profitable. We don't have but a it's, full it's employment about, plan and, for and creatives. Maybe, no. And maybe not everybody who works does so because they derive their personal identity from it. Maybe sometimes people just work because it funds the stuff that they do find meaningful. But these are not ideas that are in people's bubbles. And so these folks in tech 
are well-meaning, but they're coming at it from one really specific reference point yeah. as opposed I, to taking a look at all of the possible reference points that will be affecting real people in real life. I want to I want to get back to Leo's kind of initial question about Facebook's ability to be proactive. Uh -huh. And we have example after example after example of no. I think uh, <laughs> discrimination in advertising is the biggest one that just yes. kept on coming back. And Washington State, uh, our attorney general, was the one who really just slammed down and said, we've got you saying you're going to do more, waiting a few months, saying you're going to do more, and then we have more proof after those two announcements. You're still not it's being proactive. It's almost a parody at this point. Yeah. You, can, and, and, you, you can just see it happening. Yeah. And so it, it's just a company that has never at any point really risen up and said anything about, this is a story that's not in the headlines yet and we really care about it, mm -hmm. uh, unless it's them saying, we really swear virtual reality is going to be a big deal. Like that's as far as they've gotten in being proactive is, here's a thing that we've invested in and we swear you're going to want to spend money in it. That's like as far as they get for being proactive about their sense of future and responsibility. Sure. I mean, I think that Elon Musk is sort of a weird exception to that. Um, his proactiveness My is often just kind of spouting off, but he is genuinely concerned <laughs> about, about things energy. that could more, make him a lot of money. More yeah. microdosing throughout the tech industry would probably be a good well, thing. No, I, I think the Elon Musk example is great because when if you put aside all the weird stuff he's he done over the last He follows me everywhere year. I go, though, my Tesla. It records every move I make, what pedals I push, but what buttons I push. But this is a dude who's genuinely concerned about energy supply, clean energy, I renewable agree. energy. And AI. I agree. Yeah. And, and, and the are, ramifications of AI. Just Although, you know, there's that whole, oh, by bit. the way, AI can now write your journalism stories better than people can. Sure. Thing that came out this week, and that yeah. was a little unnerving. Honestly, <laughs> I, I don't, I would hate to say, well, Elon's good and Mark's bad. No, Because no. honestly, I think they all come from a similar ground of mm -hmm. being. Yeah. Where they believe in technology, they believe ultimately technology make lives better, and they don't, I think your bubble in that mm -hmm. description is actually very good. They just don't... Is that yours? I mean, Both I, I think you. it's 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 our entire industry. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. we can take joint ownership. Uh -huh. In general, uh, yeah. that living in the bubble is what keeps them from seeing the consequences mm -hmm. of what they see is just, well, this is good. We're, we're changing the world for the yeah. better. And I, you know, as a technology user, uh, was very bullish about the future uh, sure. initially, right? The internet's yeah. going to democratize. It's going to oh, eliminate yeah. gatekeepers. And, oh. and was not clear, uh, yeah. and probably should have been, what the consequences of true free speech are uh, and this amplification what what i didn't know about i don't think people have thought about was the amplification sure. that's the power it, it the, is the power and then yeah. people who have power already through money right. and through access get more power to amplify right. it's concentrated is it, yeah. this is too long a question to give you i only want a minute or two answer <laughs> is there any hope Oh, the hope has been established already by an internet. I I would point to myself as a 37-year-old who was able to access a completely different worldview in life outside of a very small suburban town by simply clicking around and finding oh, like-minded folks we and stories. And I think, see the and benefits. I think that has grown and grown and grown. Those systems are still out there. They're still decentralized, wonderful computer systems that let us do some really cool things and become more human and more connected. So That's you not think it's say. possible to turn to, to take the technology we have and make it better, make it more human, make it more fair I think without that giving it up. You can't, you don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I, I mean, my dream is a completely decentralized, uh, version of social media that isn't terrible that everyone actually chooses to use. Uh, and I think it could happen within the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see that happening tomorrow or one year from now, yeah, but I, I was do on really Mastodon. believe. I loved Mastodon, but it's not exactly. I yeah. I mean, there's like 27 different skeletons of that not working, but I do believe that is a large step forward for mm -hmm. us as a society and as governments all coming together and trying to find an infrastructure that's a little more open and free in that way. Well, I we do now see the consequences, but maybe it's too late. I think that the, my hope, and this is a little dark, my hope lies outside of the world that I live in right now. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that our world is over. I think that the society that we have built in the way that we have built it will not last forever. We screwed up. We've screwed it up. And there is somebody somewhere mm -hmm. in a small town in Indonesia right now who's thinking about something that we don't know well, and we don't take? understand a plague, yet. And it a will nuclear war, a zombie attack? No, what's it going to take? No, not necessarily, but, just, but, just but what's, cultures yeah. come and go and yeah. rise and fall. And yeah. we may have done a really great job at some things and now somebody else is going to do a really okay. great job at other things. I Usually think we're those, witnessing, well, we're those witnessing come with bloodshed and a massive loss sure, of life. Sure, but yeah. not necessarily. Not always, though. Sometimes it's... Um, Look at most of Europe. Europe has just had, you know, like... It's true. Like Britain, 
what yeah, was, there what, was like Dickensian Britain, and that was a little rough. But it, but, but but not no, not been does, completely destroyed. So, what we're, we're, sort of we're seeing the end of European colonialism, as it were, because you could argue that America was pretty much the last the last wave of that. And yeah. if you look at our actions from the 19th and 20th century, we were we were doing the same thing where we were acting like our job is to export our culture, our values. I think you could say the consequences of industrialism and yeah. colonialism are two world but, wars, millions of deaths. But I think uh, they're when, pretty you, when severe. you have when yeah, you have yes. a group but you have generations now who are aware of the fragility of the planet and the finite amount of resources we have left. And that's, that's but there's my point. And well, that's that, why we're going to not have a cultural revolution. We know how painful we already and bloody have, that could be. We already we're going to go, all right, just take me. I, well, there I, could I, be I, economic, I, I, I mean, we well, may no, be in the beginning of some terrible economic decay right now. I yeah. mean, you look around our country, the haves versus the have nots. It's terrible. The, the have not may continue to grow to a point where we simply do not have the power we used to. Yeah, but you know and who's it could gonna, be war related you know or it could it's just not be some decay. Guy in Indonesia, it's I think China. it's infrastructure decay because you take a look at the fact that we don't spend in this country to keep up roads. We don't spend on public health in a way that guarantees that children and young adults are as healthy as they could be or yeah. are launched into adulthood as, as productive. Way more death and childbirth. Society. I like oh, that you asked about the future of, of how technology will affect us and, and expect us to only have one or two minutes. I didn't even think about talking about World War III enti <laughs> but, entirely No, I computers. think the point that I was getting around to eventually is since technology has disintermediated specialization and it's, it's redistributed economic opportunity, it's going to really usher in a whole new cultural model. Well, that's what we were hoping for, it's, but I don't see any sign of that. Again, the future is not evenly distributed. You just have to look for it outside of where we are now. I think we're all products of the 20th century at this table. Yeah, and yeah you're not logged into the right Twitter accounts over there, Leo. The culture's yeah. happening. I'm logged off Twitter, too. But yeah. I'm with you. I do feel like decentralized open mm -hmm. is the future. It is, a, it is doable. It is out there. Yeah. But I feel like it also is facing incredible resistance from two forces. One, of course, the moneyed economic yeah. forces of Facebook, Amazon, mm -hmm. Google. And the other, frankly, is, I think, a, a, a population, global population, that is afraid of disruption, yeah. of uh. famine, of war, and will settle for mm -mm. a surveillance economy as long... Look at China. China's a perfect example well, where I in order to pursue order... Do you know what the number one app in China right now is? Number one, beating Didi, beating WeChat. Mm -hmm. It's it's a propaganda tool from the Communist Party called Shuixi Changguo, which translates to study powerful country. Mm -hmm. It is number one in China. Uh, we know about the social credit scores. Or do they say it's we number know one about, in China? Yeah. No, it is number one. Apple says it's number one. It's, Apple, <laughs> it's yeah. number one, you could say, because, well, if you're anybody in China, you're going to download it. It doesn't mean you're going to love it or use it, but yeah. you better well damn well download it, right? They know whether you're downloading it. It um, sounds like, a, sounds like a, a popular president getting 99.9% .9 of the vote. Yeah. But I don't think it's like that in China. I think that the vast majority of the populace, not the Ouijers, mm -hmm. there's, there's definitely pockets of resistance. But in, in, in return for modernization, this is, this is kind of the story of China. Well, this is the in Three Gorges Dam. Exactly. When, I remember when the Three Gorges Dam was built back in the 1990s, one, a reporter from Rolling Stone went and was like, you're wiping out villages in this gorgeous landscape. And in return, the guide was like, I don't have electricity in an oven. Exactly. And I would like those things. Exactly. And the guide was like, oh, this is what we're up against. Yeah. But you, I, I, I actually think there think are people that, who, who yeah. want order who want peace, who want food, who want their, know their children will be safe yeah. and will give up s dumb things like privacy mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. return. And well, I think that's where- a fairly modern construct anyway that's when you right. think about it. That's but, right. I mean, that, I'm not saying I don't like privacy because I do. I really like oh, it. Oh, I love but it. I think you're but gonna it's a have luxury. To look, I think you're going to have to look at the global South for what the next iteration of a pro-tech culture is. Um, one of the most exciting stories in the aughts was how Africa had effectively leapt over broadband and gone to mobile commerce right. and mobile sure. banking and back in the yeah. early 2000s. Yeah. And what I really admired and liked about the, it, this was a culture, it was like, we have these needs, we need a solution that works for us and not a solution that is laid down in a culture that doesn't understand the constraints we have. And I feel we're going to see that again, either through people who are climate change refugees and understand very intimately how fragile our communications networks and our civilizations can be, or through people who have been facing shrinking resources and can ask themselves how they can deploy technology to manage those resources or not even need as much of them as they used to. 
You're very optimistic. I am. I am. People are really creative, though. We've been around for how many thousands of years at this point? And yeah. the one last thing is that the global population is about to peak. Mm -hmm. So that's, pro I think, probably a good thing. We get to take the pressure off that a little bit. And somebody somewhere will take mm -hmm. advantage of all this change. It just may not be here. And I not think we've gotten really cocky about it. Mm -hmm. And then there's CRISPR. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> We're such you a young we have, a, we have all the equilibrium. It's all perfect. Everybody's no. happy. And then, oh, we got genetic the modification. The U.S. is it's such over. a young country. We're so young, especially compared to places like Britain, which can go back, which go back centuries. Um, and China, which same. Do you think, though, that America is any is the hope of the West anymore? No. 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 But I, I think also one of the peculiar things that hobbles American culture is our inability to think in terms of the long now or the long future because we don't, we don't have, have one. Well, we don't have a conception of a long past either. For us, our pa for us, we're like, oh, we started when we landed at Jamestown, which no, there were lots of people here before that. Yeah, we oh just, yeah, them. We just don't consider it part of our our national had you, culture. Had history. you, however asked that question 20 years ago, you might say, yeah, because all the innovation, all the invention, we created the internet, mm -hmm. we're changing the world, the future is ours. Uh, and then what's happened 20 years later is this grim dystopia that's emerging out of the <laughs> surveillance capitalism. Mm -hmm. Exactly what a lot of people predicted would happen. Well, that's what's so fascinating to me. The Diamond Age me. came out like 20 odd years ago yeah, and it was just basically- Watching this happen in slow motion. Like, mm -hmm. yep, okay, we th yeah. Dystopia is yeah. already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Exactly. Uh, let's take a break on that gloomy <laughs> note. <laughs> Time to drink whiskey. I really like this group. Sam, I'm sorry we can't give you some uh, some of this fine uh, cask strength whiskey. Uh, I live in Washington State. We have our own inebriants. Good. <laughs> uh, Sam Sam is always a welcome uh, visitor to our shores from uh, his his eerie up there in the Pacific Northwest, Sam Moscovich, tech culture editor mm -hmm. at Ars Technica. We're also thrilled to have Lindsay Turrentine here, who is now in charge of all of CBS. Ooh. VP at CBS. Is it CBS I, right? It's CBS I. It's VP of... It's a long title, but basically I'm in charge of tech content at CBS I. Yeah. In charge of tech content at CBS mm -hmm. I. I. <laughs> Throw the I in. <laughs> you know, I was the third employee at CBS I at yeah. CNET. What? Yes. I'll tell you that story someday. Yeah. Back in the early 90s. Mm. Before I got there. Halsey Minor and oh, Shelby God. Bonney were back east. And uh, they said, we want to start a television network yes. for technology. Yeah. And I was doing a radio show. They said, you're the only guy who really knows about national broadcasting. Would mm -hmm. you come to work for us? And I you did. Until Halsey decided he didn't like me. That didn't last that long. But uh, it was an interesting experience. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I started yeah. before Halsey left, and then, but, but not long before he left. Yeah. So. I made their first pilot. And then I was the guy who told him, guys, I did the due diligence on starting a television network. I said, do you have half a billion to throw away? Because that's how much it's going to cost you before you start making money. Mm -hmm. And that's when they said, well, maybe we'll think of some other things we can do. Yeah, they diversified mm -hmm. pretty quickly. Yeah. yeah, it's called the internet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Our show today brought to you by the internet and people who make the internet safe and private for you, Express VPN. We've been talking a lot about privacy. There's actually something you can do proactive right now to protect yourself, and I'm not just talking about an open access Wi-Fi hotspot at a coffee shop. I'm talking about your own home. I'm talking about wherever you go. ExpressVPN encrypts your traffic from your device, your computer, to their servers. There's servers all over the world. You emerge into the Internet, the country of your choice, with the IP of your choosing, so that no one knows it's you. And your ISP, your carrier cannot spy on you. They can't see what you're doing. And it's so easy with ExpressVPN. They have apps for every platform, Mac, Windows, iOS, Android. They run seamlessly in the background. You push one button, boom, you're protected. Turn it off when you want. And the thing about ExpressVPN, they have so many servers. They have so much bandwidth, they don't slow you down. And I think a lot of people stop using VPNs because they say, ah, you know, it's, it's inconvenient. It's too slow. It's as convenient and fast as it can be with ExpressVPN. You can now safely surf wherever you are, even public Wi-Fi, without being snooped on, without having your personal data stolen. Read their privacy policy. I, I always encourage you when you look at VPNs to read and see, do they log? No. Do they keep track of anything you're doing? No. Do they know anything about your business? No. It's rated number one on the tech radar, 30-day money-back guarantee, and it's less than $7 a month. If you don't want to hand over your online history to your internet provider, your data resellers, expressvpn.com slash twit. 
you'll get a three extra month bonus when you sign up for a one-year package. And again, 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk. ExpressVPN.com slash twit. ExpressVPN.com slash twit. It's our uh, absolute choice for VPN. You're not going to Barcelona for I'm Mobile World I'm not going to Barcelona. <laughs> I wish that go? I were, though. I know, I, you know, no, I don't usually. I go every once in a while. Mm -hmm. Sort of so feel like it's like an every three years kind it's of It's coming up this next weekend. It's coming up this next weekend, yeah. Uh, the first taste of new phones at uh, Mobile World Congress will be this Wednesday. But Samsung's doing it in San Francisco, right. which is weird. It's it's like the opposite of at Mobile World Congress, uh, almost literally. Uh, it's their Galaxy S10, mm -hmm. and we don't we know everything about it, right? Everything's been yes. leaked as usual with a Samsung event. Even more than, at, but I mean, it's like down to every single spec and which phones are coming out, and it's it's a, an incredible amount of nuance. I almost feel like they do this on purpose, just because they know they're well. We're not going to surprise anyone anyway. Might well, I think that it keeps the excitement going for longer. Yeah, and having a steady stream of leaks gets more and more people interested and wanting to see it. They know that there's something for them, so then they actually tune in to see the real pictures. And it, it's, it's. I, I'm. I have no idea, honestly, if Samsung is leaking these intentionally, but uh, they're not fighting it. I do know that. I feel like they have Evleek's phone number. I'm just saying. <laughs> I just can't prove anything. <laughs> can't uh, prove anything. Uh, you know, Apple will continue to be this super secret. I nobody knows uh, company, although they haven't been able to. Mm, once no, it gets to the supply so chain, much different than they used to. Yeah, be. once yeah. it gets it to the supply to chain, all bets are off. They yeah. start making it, and nobody's going to keep that a secret. Um, all right. So, what what do we know? What do we think? Are we excited about we the new what? galaxies? Yeah, about uh, so many galaxies. What five of them? Mm -hmm. right? four, four, I think, is, yeah. is four, but maybe five is sort of the the question because there's this mysterious, <laughs> four, monstrous five G. What's the potential folding model. phone? Is that one of them? No, that's the TCL. Well, the folding phone for Samsung. Oh, you're yes. talking about the, the the slap wrist one. No, yeah. I'm talking about the, yeah, yeah. We'll you're talk talking about that about next. The, the I like Samsung the pricing phone. strategy they've got where they've got the higher end ones and then the entry level. Oh, that's good. Entry level. How low are like, the entry level? Oh, not low. It's like it's seven ninety nine or yeah. something. It's, but you um, know they wouldn't be doing that if Apple weren't feeling the pinch from overpriced phones, right? Yeah. And they're also going to have a Plus version, actually right. named Plus. That's what I always mm -hmm. find so bold about Samsung's naming. <laughs> yeah. It's like take the it's Apple plus paradigm and then just do it. The yeah, same we'll just copy. Way. It's yeah. working. You people are habituated to it. Sure, yeah. so we're yeah. not going to make you think. Just buy our phone, please. So there'll be an S ten and S ten Plus. There'll be a cheaper S ten, which is the E. Mm -hmm. They'll be the, as you say, mysterious, monstrous 5G version. There is a, a what, four cameras on the plus on the back, <laughs> two on the front. I'm not even joking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's so a, many cameras. <laughs> so many like, cameras. If you had gone back to the year 2000 and said, in the future, your phone will actually eliminate every, the, the need for cameras outside Isn't that of professional amazing? photography, yeah. I would have been like, what, how? Yeah. And I now mean, we're busy talking about phones with four cameras. Phone but that, to me, is such an easy move on their part in terms of taking relatively cheap sensors, mm -hmm. dumping them in, and then having every blogger get out there and vlogger get out there and say, look at the photos. Mm -hmm. It is the such a huge selling point for any, like MK, oh, I, Marquez Brownlee, he, you know, he's going to get up there and he's going to test out all those those lenses and that's gonna that's gonna move units. So I'm not shocked at all that they're going to have like 20, it's going to be like a spider's eyeball by the time we get to, you know, 2022. Cam cam looks, let's phones. face it, uh, cameras are probably the number one feature on phones these mm -hmm. days, not the phone. And it's uh, the differentiator when every phone looks exactly the same. If can, you can they say, compete with Google, though? Doesn't Google see, have the magic the Google foo here? The, Google's interest in the Pixel has, we were going to talk about this elsewhere, but it's gone up 50% in the last year at least, a little bit more than mm -hmm. that. But it's still a minor blip. Still a minor blip, but people talk about it, and mm -hmm. Google has done a fantastic job getting people who love cameras interested in their yes. phone. And I have to say, the thing about the Google Pixel is that the integration of, of Hey Google, oh, the integration, it's so, good. it's so good. And so compare that to what Samsung is going to offer. And Samsung can offer they the most beautiful Bixby, hardware in the world. Which is a shame. Yeah. They're, they're still working at yeah. it. And there's yeah. going to be a Bixby button, it looks like, on these EvLeak photos. There is uh, a Bixby button. Of course button. there's going to be a Bixby <laughs> button. <laughs> Come on. There's probably going to be four Bixby buttons at this point. <laughs> I do not understand this. I, I do yeah. not understand why they're still working and with and not licensing and not somebody, licensing yeah. Google's technology. No, I don't get it because Google's assistant is so. One of the things we do for a fun around the house because this is how we roll is we ask Siri and Google Assistant the same question and see how I do they, this all the time and see how oh, yeah. they answer. Yeah. And um, Google Assistant just nine times out of ten yeah. much much better. 
So you do have some of these assistants in your home. My husband covers mobile technology for Tom's Guide. Oh, so, that's your excuse. So we have all. So he, <laughs> we have an entire room full of the stuff that gets shipped for testing. Well, the, the market has spoken in terms of this proprietary button. We, people are still clearly buying S8s and S9s with this ridiculous Bixby button, not being able to remap it to a better service or even to just, I don't know, a camera button or some sort of shortcut. So they're they not going to, as long as, as long as Bixby can penetrate one market and give Samsung that kind of data and that kind of access, it's going to be there, plain and simple. Samsung has the um, data. They probably someone, know that nobody pushes that button. We have someone Depends in the chat room named Bleak who's pointing out that Samsung is doing very well with Bixby in the Korean market. So oh, interesting. I, mm -hmm. I appreciate I appreciate that because this does point out that we're looking at this from a really American point of view and AI is going to be something where it's it's going to be tied into different geographical markets too. There's also historically Samsung has been at great pains to differentiate from Android and Google. They don't even want to mention the A word. Mm -hmm. uh, they looked for a long time at putting a, a different operating system in their stuff ties in but they yeah. couldn't make it work. Mm -hmm. uh, I really feel like Samsung as much as they could wants to be the, uh, the not Google. Well, here's the other That's thing that Samsung is license. doing that we don't think about in American households. Mm -hmm. Samsung has absolutely penetrated the, the home appliance market. Yeah, I, Good point. all of my appliances yeah, are Samsung me too. now. Yeah, and they, they make that stupid sing-song chime though all the I time. I love it. They're singing I all love, the time. I love it. I actually love it when my washer sings to me. I haven't turned it off. I like it a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's very. It's Your very. It's done. Very, it's time to go. I get super happy. So my is service? done. How is the service on those? And it has gotten much, much better. It was okay. terrible at first, mm -hmm. uh, and now I had a they problem had with. I had a problem with my refrigerator, yeah. and they were extra, extra, yeah. extra helpful because yeah. I think yeah. it was so bad in the past. Mm. Yeah. In any case, most of those devices come with at least the ability to be attached to your network, mm -hmm. or they will soon. And I think that that's what Bixby has to do with. Yeah. Once Samsung has got all the hardware in your home outside of your phone, potentially, even if you don't own a Samsung phone, mm -hmm. that there's gonna be some tie in there. And Samsung really does want to hook and make create interoperability between your television and your devices and eventually your phone. One I would love to see how Samsung and Amazon are going to deal with each other then, because Amazon is doing its best to wire your home and, and get you from point of sale to point of use in your yeah. household. Mm -hmm. Samsung is coming out from exactly the opposite direction. Where does that do you, come from? Do you think that's why they keep Bixby alive? Because at some point they hope that they can yeah. introduce yes. Bixby yeah. into Absolutely. your home. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's 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 what I was saying. The last few Bixby years it's there yeah. to help your appliances talk to each other. Right. The last few years at CES, the whole appeal to smart appliances and smart home has been the idea that the cloud of information associated with you, the, your favorite recipes, your groceries, your your family schedule, how often you eat, what times of day you eat, all of that is eventually going to get loaded into your appliances, and then your appliances oh can, and then your appliances can order groceries for you, so you don't have to do it, or they can send you sure. reminders so that if they detect that you're driving by a store, they can be like, ping, you need to buy milk, and you can hit that on the way home. Like that is the vision of the smart future that they have. I just, as long as they keep putting in the headphone jack, I don't really care about <laughs> yeah, any I can't of take, that. I can't take a refrigerator without a headphone jack That's either. That's absolutely <laughs> right. You gotta, they don't have the courage to take that out. They will also, yeah. by the way, replace the notch with the new dot. Ugh. This is gonna be the uh, wave of the future, a circular cutout for the camera. Mm. Sure, mm. it looks uh, better. I think it's less obtrusive than a dot. I mean, a notch. Yeah. A dot's better than a notch. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll see. Apple's mm. the trendsetter there. Mm. I would just mostly want to have a little Android background image that makes it look like Johnny Five from Short Circuit whenever <gasps> you're frozen up on that. That's my dream there. Oh. The, the shape is perfect. That. I think you could oh, do that. that would be delightful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Just a little Johnny Five dot up there. Yeah. 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 Um, Does the Elder Barge song play as your ringtone then too? It's <laughs> Johnny, he says. <laughs> oh my God! I don't know. You guys are a different generation. A cool one. We agree. I, uh, yes. You want to talk about Arthur Godfrey? I'm here, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't. I don't know what this Johnny Five stuff is. Uh, they will. Uh, Samsung will do a foldable phone. Although I noticed there's not a lot of leaks about the foldable phone. Would they offer it? Do you think it's going to be for mm -hmm. sale? Gosh, they really want to make it for sale. I think that mm -hmm. it, that this is going to be important for some trend setting and just getting attention back onto phones. It's a differentiator it's as well. It's a differentiator. It's going to look great on the gram. It's going to look great on the gram. Because you'll have people mm -hmm. like doing, you know, they have an umbrella and they're smiling into the rain and their wrist will be prominently displayed. And, and Oh, you're wow. talking about the TCL one now? Yeah. So, so oh, oh, yeah, yeah. This sorry, is different sorry, from the I foldable jumped ahead phone. To, I'm sorry, I jumped right. ahead to the wrist. Samsung's so, been so talking sorry. about the foldable phone for yeah. a while. 
I suspect if I were just going to, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not out there personally reporting on it, but if I were going to guess, mm -hmm. Samsung will talk about it at their event, but mm -hmm. not release it at the same time as the Galaxy phones. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's going to be a foldable Galaxy. Okay. Could be wrong. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I think yeah. GCL is trying to get in on this conversation because yeah. people like us mm -hmm. are sitting around being like, oh yeah, and then there's that wrist one. And yeah. if Samsung's already talking about a foldable phone, TCL is going to come, people are going to be really fascinated by the idea of this. This looks terrible. Oh. This looks like a slave bracelet. This doesn't, <laughs> this is not... <laughs> I'm a slave to my technology. Well, Look how big it, that is. Is it really that much of a leap from the Apple Watch? No. I, I mean, think I, so. You know, the I think question it's, once it's out because it's people, hard. Have, yeah. people I think have accepted we were, those weird models. Yeah. We were talking about this right before the show that, that the, the potential of a phone that you bend around your wrist is mm -hmm. actually potentially fantastic for people like me who often don't have pockets. Right. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. you're already shackled I, to technology. Why not just... Mm -hmm. Go all the way. I mean, yeah, no, I remember the spade a spade. Yeah. I, I can't They're remember when there was that. They should clothing. call it the shackle. Can you the imagine if they don't change women's clothing to give us pockets, but they're willing to launch an entire new tech category? <laughs> I, but you know what? Actually, yes. pockets have. Have you noticed that recently dresses have pockets? pockets. Yeah, it's true. They're Finally. not pants. Yeah. Well, no, pants also have pockets. Pants have yeah. pockets. Sometimes dresses have pockets. Like this do not have pockets. pockets. Yeah. And now they do. And also yoga pants have pockets. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yes. What's the point of They're wearing yoga pants if you have something thighs, in your pockets? Yeah. And it is life-changing. Yeah. Oh. Well, sometimes I, the I, pants pockets are just vestigial or they're for show. And you're right. like, oh, it's, it's nothing actually it's like fits the back in flippers there. on a whale. Nothing <laughs> happens. But um, Andy the Clown in our chat room makes her own pockets. But she's yeah. got, like, phones in there and bananas and all mm. sorts. You know, the, the scarf that comes with a pocket knitted in, that's the stuff. Oh, so the, hide, the hide a pocket in the scarf. Hide That's a pocket. I'm just waiting for somebody in the chat room to be like, "Remember cargo pants, you guys? They still make them." I still yeah. wear them. Utilicilt or bust. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what I'm wearing under here. I Are promise. you wearing yeah. a utilicilt? Oh God, no, never. Oh, okay. No, I, I do want to say though <laughs> that we've got Samsung, LG, and TCL. They're all interested in ultra thin screen technology. So for Samsung to come out and say we have a foldable phone, just to hold it up and say it exists, mm -hmm. is a giant attack against LG, which has just been rolling over them with sure. in terms of almost OLED technology. literally rolling over them with rollable right. screens. So that's, I mean, that's, I think that makes sense for them to say, hey, here's phones you can definitely buy, and here's the one you're going to want to buy when we can make it more affordable. So your move, LG, that sort of thing. I think it's a power move uh, sure. because that OLED. Well, and LG is behind in the phone world, so mm -hmm. Samsung definitely has a chance to, to make that move. Absolutely. We will be covering the Samsung event live. I, I presume you're going to go. It's in San Francisco. We, we will be covering it live also. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Uh, I'll, I'll, we'll have dueling streams. Mm -hmm. Ours uh, begins 11 a.m. Pacific. That's 2 p.m. Eastern time. What we're going to do, it's on Wednesdays. We're going to start Windows Weekly uh, early at 9 a.m. And then right after Windows Weekly, we'll go into the live coverage mm -hmm. of the Samsung Unpacked event where you will learn absolutely nothing new. <laughs> but it's always fun to watch a Samsung you event to see, see what crazy things they are. And you to. may you might find out more about something like the folding phone, which we don't know more about yet. We know right. a little bit, so you might get something kind of interesting. Is it? There. Do you think price that's holding it back or technology? They, it looked a very thick. I think it's technology. I think the the one that we saw that was an off brand at CES that we actually played with was the Royal. Yeah, it it was. Um, not something you would actually no. want yet. Yeah. Like fascinating to see, but not quite ready. And so I think for something like that, price may not be important. No, well, also just the the sheer sustainability of that on a wrist. How much of a beating can it currently take? What kind yeah. of plastic and polymer mix well, are we looking at? Well, now we're the snap bracelet again. The snap we're, we're back. We can't stop talking you about it. I'm just saying any of that stuff. Any foldable well, phone, anything like that is going to have that sort of wear and tear shackle. issue that needs a couple Ooh. generations. Well, it's a tickle the, shackle. Well, one of the core t problems with technology, though, is how do you make it so it hold, it holds up to a life where, you know, you, you are either washing dishes that or you're doing sports. That thing is not going to hold up to anything. Or you're camping That's or silly. you're roughhousing with, with Well, think about how or, long that LG rollable television mm -hmm. took to actually make it to market. So we saw those foldable screens, what, three years ago? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then two years ago, we saw a prototype of the rollable screen, but it wasn't for sale. This year it's going for sale. So if we think of this as the first year we've even seen prototypes of bendable phones, mm -hmm. two years, three, I'd say. Take a little while. And then next year we're all buying one, all of us. Let's do it. Let's make a pack. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of, I mean. As I want to do like a, one of those snap bracelets where you just you have it like this and then you're done with the call and you go whack and it's yeah. a bracelet and you walk mm -hmm. off. That I would buy. That would be like an excellent way to hang up on somebody in a, in a huff, Fuck. too. Oh, this my God. That would be great in movies. Just, <laughs> I'm done, Betty. It's over. Whack.
yes, yes, you get me. I'm telling you, there's a future in that. I don't know if you could do it more than once. Yeah. You'd probably break it immediately, but oh it'd be satisfying. Yeah. That's the key. Our show today brought to you by Wasabi. Wasabi's hot cloud storage. And I, uh, I think this is a really interesting company. Uh, you know that I am a fan of uh, Carbonite, have been for years. David Friend, a good friend of mine, started it with his buddy Jeff Flowers. In order to make Carbonite work, they actually patented and invented a revolutionary process of laying data on disks sequentially. Now, your, your computer does it in blocks, but doing it sequentially had some real benefits to data uh, density, but also speed and reliability. That's the technology that makes Wasabi efficient and affordable. And really cool. I know it's a new name to you. Everybody, nobody lost their job by buying, you know, Amazon or Google or Microsoft. But I've got to tell you, add a fourth name to that list when you go shopping for hot cloud storage because Wasabi has some real advantages. We're all moving more and more data to the cloud. This is businesses, of course. In fact, by 2025, analysts say there'll be 163 zettabytes in the cloud. <laughs> I don't even know what that is. That's 21 zeros. Crazy. Well, Wasabi has a system that will let you store your data in the cloud 80% less and six times faster than S3. It supports the S3 API, so you already know how to use it, but it's 80% cheaper, six times faster. It's HIPAA compliant, FINRA compliant, CJIS compliant. Really, uh, nowadays, cloud storage is probably more secure than on-premises storage. It's really safe up there. And to make it even safer, they have a new form of immutable storage. You can designate some data as immutable, it can't be changed, protects it from cryptoware, you know, ransomware, from fumble-fingered employees. You could say, this data, that's safe. That data is really safe. And man, it is great. There's one tier of service, free unlimited egress. That makes a big deal when it comes to planning and budgeting because you know it's not going to cost you to egress your data. They'll even send you, if you have a lot of data, a Wasabi ball. You can migrate petabytes of data, copy it to the ball, send it to Wasabi, it's up in the cloud. I think Wasabi is really impressive, and I want you to take a look at it. I'm, I know, you know it's a new name. You need to know more about it. But when you go to the boss and you say it's 80% cheaper and it's 600% faster, they're going to listen. You can experience Wasabi for yourself. W-A-S-A-B-I. Free unlimited storage for a month. You go to wasabi.com, click the free trial link, and enter the code TWIT. You're going to get unlimited data for a month, a fifth the price. Wow. Six times faster. Wasabi.com, the offer code is TWIT. Uh, you'd, you'd be crazy not to at least check it out. That's all I can say. Wasabi.com, offer code TWIT. Anything else at Mobile World Congress? There's a new uh, ThinQ phone. Am I saying that right? I think so. Or ThinQ. <laughs> I don't know how you say it. That's the LG. Thinku. Thinku. The LG, you know, we were just talking about LG and, and they, they, they've they kind of accepted this backseat uh, phone. Don't get too far in the backseat. Remember HTC? They got so <laughs> far in the backseat they were left behind. I know. And so it'll be interesting to see if they can kind of sneak around and, and, and suggest something that will <sighs> make that phone more I keep, I keep trying these so phones. I don't get excited. Phone space anymore. It's tough. Is it really just a two company world now? Samsung and. Uh, an Google. iPhone yeah. and Google. I guess I don't know. I think Google f phone sales don't really. They've they've been improving. Yeah. I mean, it's it's they more of a all year they sold fewer people. phones last year than uh, Apple sold in a month. Yeah. Oh, for sure. But there's just really one. fastest growing U.S. smartphone brand, forty three percent year over year growth. Yeah, but if you're starting from a really small number, yeah, forty three percent. It's really tell you small, anything. but people still get yeah. excited about this one, and they don't get excited about other phones, and yeah. that's the difference. I love my Pixel. Also, 3. you look at how well good, at the potential for them to integrate with their smart home technology, having sure. your phone connect yeah. with that. I, I don't think you can overstate that. That's and an I think advantage. it's important for Google to stick it out. Mm -hmm. while waiting for whatever the next technology is. Because at yeah. some point in the future, we are not all going to sit around with this and look at it. Yeah. We'll be using something else. Mm. So it's really they, just a matter of mm -hmm. making sure that, that phone manufacturers understand how people use their screens and what they're mm. using them for while they're on the go until they, until HoloLens or whatever takes over. Does it, it's not, 
I was going to say, it's not the hardware, it's the services. Every yeah. big company has its own version of service. I know there's a dashboard of some of the stories, and they all seem to connect to proprietary services that would be way better on that manufacturer's device. And, you know, Google with its camera, the big part of that is the machine learning, that you need their app. Right. And, like, in a pinch, if you sideload that Google uh, camera app onto another phone and make it work, they're still cobbling together your data and pushing that forward. So that's still a win. So that's when I look at all of these different manufacturers pushing ahead with Mobile World Congress, I think they all agree. Let's just get them in our devices and users' hands and make them stick around for more than a year so that we can just hook them into those services. What, what I think is interesting about Mobile World Congress this year is that they are no longer Mobile World Congress. It's MWC, kind of like when KFC went to just being oh, KFC. Or CES went to CES. Went to being CES, yeah. It's, yeah. it's now MWC. Oh, that positions them for whatever's post-mobile. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that this year we're talking about new shapes to phones and mm -hmm. there'll be a lot of crazy little shapes, but it's like a bridge year. So you yeah. have to be in this business if you want to participate in whatever's coming next. You have to have a foot in the business. Is that the idea? I think you have to understand, like, like like we were saying, you have to understand what is done with mm -hmm. the device. Isn't it, though, I mean, we were just talking about how afraid we are of Google spying on us. Isn't this the perfect spy device? It, in many ways, yeah. But it doesn't seem to phase people? Is it just us that are talking about it? No, I think everybody talks about it. And but nobody I think does they also anything accept about it. it. Yeah. yeah. Do, I, I feel I like people know. trust Google. Am I wrong, Sam? <laughs> How many people obsessively Ooh. watch the tech news to see what Google's been up to in terms of I trust uh, Google, in terms of the deals they've been making, or the way they treat their employees, or yeah, but they seem unlike Facebook. I mean, if you compare Google to Facebook, Google seems to skate a little bit more than Facebook does. <laughs> really, or not? Maybe that's just me. Yeah, I think, I think Google no. You're actually right, in does terms a better of, job with with the press. Okay. Yeah, I they do they, a better job with the press. Yeah. They're in the West. They've they've sort of the fact that Google is a verb. I mm -hmm. think gives them that sort of leeway. You know, nobody. You know, you people use Facebook as a verb generally in a negative way as of late. I find so. I think that they've been they have been skating by, even though there have been antitrust stories. There have been moments of negative press. But yeah, I would say absolutely in the public eye, they and Apple are sort of neck and neck in that general. Well, I like what they've got. I yeah, I love their maps in Google's case. They're the cool not tech. They're the cool tech because they've managed to spin a perception that they're responsive, that they're designed for it. People want to be associated with the halo effects, I think. Yeah, um, I think it's true. The other thing that yeah. all of these phone manufacturers have to do is anticipate what's going to happen after 5G, mm -hmm. which is why having a phone in the game is yeah. so important right now because they have to understand how consumers are going to perceive 5G, are going to interact with 5G, even though we know that 5G is so much more than what's going to happen with your phone. But the notion of, part of that super high-speed internet everywhere you go, is that is that what makes 5G interesting? Well, I think it, what makes 5G interesting is super high-speed and the, and the low latency. It's really the low latency. So the idea is How that... How does that change things? Well, um, the, video. Video everywhere and instantaneously, but not just video consumption, video mm -hmm. collaboration. Yeah. So I was talking with somebody on a panel from Samsung actually at CES, and he was saying, I'm in a band mm -hmm. and the rest of my band is in Korea. And I can play drums yeah, with them simultaneously. Notoriously the difficult latency. to do over the internet because you're hearing them a second later or a half second yeah. later. Exactly, yeah. so in theory, it's a workplace 5G, changer. It yeah. changes a lot of how we communicate with each other in ways that I think are going to be so very hard to appreciate until we actually are there. It's not speed, it's latency that's the real. Yeah. Yeah. It's and a for gaming, that's a huge deal. If you want to play Fortnite with a bunch of other people, you can't have a latency. The AR network. economy is going to be based on that too. Augmented reality, why? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you all right, I, I did a HoloLens demo a while back where I put, on the, I put on the headset and I was supposed to repair a pipe. The Microsoft actually walked me into a room with a bunch of broken pipes. I was supposed... <laughs> I was supposed to. Wow. I was supposed to look at the schematic on the left side of my Hololens goggles, and on the right hand side, they had a customer service rep who was yeah. going to walk me through. And then I looked straight ahead at the pipes, and the idea was this way: the customer service rep could see what I what I was seeing. I could refer to the schematic. I could fix it. I could talk to somebody. Interesting experience, but what. I noticed was conversations had a lag when I was talking to a sure. person through the headset, and call, when I when I did ver verbal queries to call up other parts of the manual and the schematic, it took a minute or two. But if you have AR and you want to do things like repair an oil rig, or you're on a space station, or you are in a firefighting type situation where you have to repair equipment in a high pressure, time sensitive environment, you want to make sure that you don't have a lag, that there's no skip out no communication, sure. things like that. And, 
And to that point, I would add that it's just the consumer level thing is you want that instantaneous access just in that first moment. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like, remember the first time you ever searched for something using Google and it just worked. It was just like that. That is what other companies want for devices that you strap to your head that have any sort of friction. The less friction there is there in terms of saying, this is going to make you a member of the connected world and offer cool augmented perks, boom. So I think it's sure. less about uh, someone out in a space station and more about somebody in their kitchen. It's yeah. actually about teleconferencing. There's a growing class of devices too, and Google just announced one that they're integrating into Google Hangouts. And the idea is that this way you can call in sure. with all your colleagues remotely. And when you don't have the lag and you don't have somebody doing that weird jerky thing on the screen when they're talking to you and all of that, well, it's going to really this help is conversations what flow Facebook too. is holding on for, mm -hmm. right? This is the Facebook Oculus investment, you know, and this was probably anticipated many years ago. Yeah. Let's just quiet, this is my theory, let's just quietly develop Oculus mm -hmm. in a way that integrates with Facebook until the latency is gone and then people really can feel like- And then the metaverse like, is real. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. yeah, and then you really are hanging out with your family right. uh, in Kansas and San Francisco and New York simultaneously mm -hmm. because you're there with them. I mean, I, and I think that there is that is the positive interpretation of this. <laughs> I, I, we'll see if they can actually kind There's of- other benefits. Survive until that benefit becomes, <laughs> right. Right, there are probably plenty of other benefits, but- So I ask everybody think. this question. I know nobody really knows the answer, but I'm gonna give you guys a chance. When? Is it going to happen? And then when what is it going to happen? Reality? Uh, 2020. 5G. 2020. Oh. It will be broadly accepted. I'm sorry. I should have been clear. Yeah. 5G phones are coming out. There will be many of them announced at Mobile World Congress. Many 5G phones. Now, not, in, not, in, not, no, no, no phones from have Google a, or Apple. Not yet. But there or will Samsung. Be phones announced. Maybe Samsung. Yeah. Oh, Samsung is announcing 5G okay. phones, most likely. Okay. Uh, there's one but Google plus and phone. Apple aren't. No. And so there will, it, 2019 is going to be the year where a few people have it, right. a few networks come online. Mm -hmm. 2020 is when most of the networks are going to come online and then a lot of people. Yep. Yeah. And by 2022, you should be able to have a conference call without wanting to kill Aren't there severe else. NIMBY issues, though, because you have to have so many cell towers for this technology? But they're, they're not towers. They're very small antenna. I mean, yes, mm -hmm. there will be NIMBY issues, and people will be really worried about them. Not in my backyard. You ain't putting that thing in my backyard. What is the radiation doing? Am I getting the cancer? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's yeah. basically like a microwave oven on every rooftop. Yeah. Well, that exactly. sounds fine. <laughs> I actually know I, I, the number of people I know who refuse to be in the same room as a microwave because they're exactly. worried about it yeah. is not zero. Exactly. Yeah, it's not and, zero for yeah. sure. Or don't stand in front of it while you're making your popcorn. But I yeah. feel like that that has kind of died off. And I'm not saying I yeah. am not taking a position on whether yeah. it's healthy or not, but I think that it will happen and mm -hmm. they're very small installs. So it's not like putting one of those giant trees on the side of the road. But they have to be within a hundred, few hundred feet of each other. There I mean, have to be a lot of them. They have to yeah. be an awful lot of them. Yeah. And that's it's also massive be, capital expense. The uh, yeah. thing I'm a little concerned about is we've already got big broadband lags in America. Um, you know, in terms of, of how how easy and how, how cheap is your access to high-speed right. internet in several belts of the country compared to rural areas. Are we going to be broadening that? Or, well, you have or, the same problem, gonna, Or right? are we going to drive across fields of alfalfa and sorghum and just every... Well, that's what, yeah, that's the same yeah. thing. I don't understand. Where are those microwave ovens going to go? Yeah. Are they, yeah, okay. It's not even that. It's the expense of putting them in if there's only five people that are going to use them. It's the okay. same yeah, reason yeah. you don't have broadband in rural areas now. Yeah. And it doesn't, that doesn't change the equation. And, you know, CNET did a fantastic package on rural broadband yes. coverage. Um, it was really quite good. And this has been a thing that has been a low-level ongoing issue th actually since, like, the start of the Internet. Argued, think, but it's picked know, up increasing urgency, especially as more agriculture becomes dependent oh, on broadband and internet access. Yeah. So the you question is- you got to have internet in that John Deere. Right. Who's yeah. going gonna to underwrite the expense? And is it going to be pockets of haves and have nots? Or are we going to get some well, sort of- It already is pockets of haves and have nots. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's terrible. You know, it's terrible. I mean, I, I grew up in a small town and I still spend a lot of time in that small town. Yeah. And it's mm -hmm. difficult. It's terrible. Uh, I hear it, from people every day. It's yeah. not great. It's not yeah. good. Even on the Sonoma coast. Yeah. AT&T no. basically doesn't work. Yeah. Which I, yeah. It's, it's just well, 20 miles from San Francisco. And, and, I, and I, in a way, I feel like this 5G thing is going to distract yeah. from the FCC's broadband plan, which as far as I can tell is moribund. Mm -hmm. Everybody's just going to defer and say, oh, no, don't worry about it. 5G's 5G's coming. Gonna, no, that doesn't fix but everything. But it doesn't fix it. it's an infrastructure issue. Well, also... Mm -hmm. Oh, I was just going to point out that we have a little ways to go in terms of phone design. Uh, what Qual Qualcomm has come out and said is the number of extra antennas that are going to be needed, the kind of design language that is going to be needed to combine a Snapdragon 855 and an X50 modem and the antenna modules and the antenna chips. Uh, you know, forget your uh, your headphone jack. That's gone. 
uh, forget your oh, tiny no, no. battery. We're gonna need 5G gonna hats. It's going to be. We're all wear five, we'll all be simultaneously receivers and senders. It'll be great. The, the, I really feel the like earliest we generations, the technology. but the earliest generations of five G are going to absolutely compromise in one way or in another, and we have to wait to see how designers really do that, or if they're like, that's just going to be a phone we make as a limited design, and it could become chicken or egg if these phones are too bulky or are too unwieldy or don't have wireless charging or have the kind of can't put your finger on this part of the phone gate. You know, there's. There's a lot that could happen there that just sets off an early adoption failure if everyone tries to rush it and the phones stink. I still think it'll be 2020 when there's a, a pretty large amount of adoption on phones. That doesn't mean all the infrastructure will be built out and it'll be a couple more years until it's until it's all fleshed out enough to be able to have that completely virtual experience. But um, I don't know. From what I'm hearing from a variety of phone manufacturers, they are working really hard on this partially I'm not worried about the manufacturers I'm worried about the carriers and the carriers because the carriers see this as the future it is it is or are they going to do what AT&T did and just label 4G 5G and I think that they I think that I think that they're going to do it it's going to take time but ultimately it might be less for them to maintain because those individual receivers are smaller and a little bit I think more nimble and there's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow sure it's almost like electric cars that way where you have the cars but the charging stations watching those move out of smaller areas yeah. um that's still a process that's yeah. ongoing well i'll tell you who will know uh when the internet doesn't work or does work they know now thousand eyes Do you know about thousand eyes this is really an interesting company they did an event in san francisco i hosted a panel uh for them about uh, a month ago and it because thousand eyes they really should call it million eyes They've got sensors all over the internet, everywhere, in every endpoint, in the middle, at the edge. And because they've got these sensors everywhere, they know what's going on. I was, they did a great um, study on cloud providers. And it's really interesting to see, for instance, that some cloud providers, I won't name names, are hopping around, you know, to get to China, they're hopping through Turkey. And you don't know this. As a user, you might notice, well, there's more latency when I do it this way. But in fact, Thousand Eyes knows exactly what's going on. And if you're in the cloud for your business, and you know what? If you're not now, you will be in the cloud for your business. It's such a benefit. You gain agility. But there's also risk, and you're losing control. And that's where Thousand Eyes is amazing. Because when your cloud app or your service isn't working 100%, you can find out what's wrong and fix it. Instant visibility down the entire service delivery path from the cloud to your end user, including all that you don't, it doesn't have to be on things you control. Thousand Eyes sensors are everywhere. It's unlike anything you've seen before. Essentially, if you're, if you're in IT, if you're in ops, you understand that there's just, that's why they draw the cloud like a little puffy cloud, but you don't know what's inside it. There's just this mysterious portion of the cloud that your stuff's going through. And I think most people just kind of go, we'll never know. I don't, why is it latent? I don't know. We'll never know. It's the cloud. Now you will know. It's like you've been blind. It's like you've been looking through a dirty windshield and Thousand Eyes comes along and squeegees it clean. And suddenly you go, wow, I can see it all. I can see it all. And you can fix whatever's going wrong. Thousand Eyes is cloud-based software. It's built to help organizations do the cloud right. No one has the eyes that Thousand Eyes has. A massive array of vantage points spanning the global internet, cloud providers, even the Wi-Fi in your local coffee shop, in private and public clouds. This is not your old school IT monitoring, which just kind of sits there in your silo and can only see what's going on inside the data center. That's not going to help you in the cloud. Thousand Eyes' unique path visualization technology Extends beyond any boundaries, allowing you to see, understand, and improve the experience for all your apps, services, and websites. I, I don't know how to explain this to you better than just say go to thousandeyes.com slash twit. That's all spelled out. T-H-O-U-S-A-N-D-E-Y-E-S dot com slash twit. Top banks, enterprises, SaaS companies, the world's largest and fastest growing brands rely on Thousand Eyes software to do the cloud and to do it right. You will be so grateful. I promise you, you will be, I will be getting emails from people saying, I can't believe I worked without this for so long. Thousandeyes.com slash twit to see what you've been missing. They also have a great ebook that you can give your boss. Five cloud migration challenges you shouldn't ignore. 
If the cloud is important to you, either today or in the future, before you do anything, visit thousandeyes.com slash twit. Don't let the internet get between you and your customers. Find out what's going on. It's a squeegee. It's a squeegee so you could see what's going on. Thousandeyes.com slash twit. Uh, let's see. What else is going on in the world? Apple has, according to John Pachkowski, uh, he's the last man standing at BuzzFeed. <laughs> I feel bad for John. He's so talented. He's so good. He'll find yeah. it even if they don't keep him. But uh, you know been what? BuzzFeed did been doing some really good. Morning, great... Silicon Valley. Yeah. Buzz, BuzzFeed's been doing great work. I know. Great work. And in, I had a I had a hilarious conversation with my 15 year old, who was like, "Wait, what?" Because they you, think it's a viral networking they, company. Even kids do. Which That's is where a they made a mistake. They, My they, daughter thinks it's a quiz engine. It is. Um, I mean, it is a quiz it engine. Is, but it and, funds and I else. was shocked. I mean, he was shocked and I, when his mom was yeah. like, "No, actually, BuzzFeed has serious news." Yeah. Yeah, but it, it is a universal really problem for BuzzFeed. My yeah. my wife, uh, we were talking about the BuzzFeed story, which I think mm -hmm. ended up being proven. I don't know. It it wasn't maybe the best source story. I don't know. Uh, what was it? It was a political story. Um, oh, I know which one you're referring to. It was, it was to. a Trump the, story, but I can't remember what is it, it was. Is it the Mueller investigation? Yeah. The yeah. Oh, that's back? right. Yeah. And then Mueller denied it. Yeah. And it made BuzzFeed look kind of bad, a little egg on their face. But we still don't know. It might. Uh, we don't actually know that it was wrong. We don't no. know that it was wrong. But anyway. They had a really strong political. Lisa success. said, well, it's BuzzFeed. Of course they don't have that scoop. And I said, no, 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 no they no, have no, a. Yeah. <laughs> that's the problem, right? They are yeah. one it's a of brand the, problem. They are one of the few outlets that actually looks at finance and economic stories through a lens of people under the age of 40. Right. Which yeah. With great is, reporters like with, Petchkowski. Yeah, which is yeah. which is vital, too, if you want to understand where things are going to be five to ten years from now in terms of employment and which industries are going to be thriving. And So... Uh, Mueller has yet yet to put out a press release denying this, but apparently, according to Petchkowski, <laughs> Apple is planning a an event for March 25th. Mm -hmm. Actually, this ties back a little bit to our conversation because this is going to be apparently a news event. Mm -hmm. This is remember Ap about Apple News. About Apple News. Yeah. They bought Texture, which is a magazine yeah. uh, subscription service. We loved it. Mm -hmm. it was a sponsor here. Um, they have their own Apple News. They've been hiring people like crazy, including some of our employees, mm -hmm. to run a news division. But they've been in, I mean, uh, when uh, Nathan disappeared, Nathan Oliveris Giles disappeared mm -hmm. to go to Apple, we didn't hear anything more from him. Uh, they've hired a lot of great people. Mm -hmm. Serenity Caldwell, they hired a lot of yeah. great people. Mm -hmm. Anand, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. So they've Chris, been very quiet. Chris they've been, Breen, John Sonia. Chris Breen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they've been building up an organization, but it's yeah. so we think this is what we're going to hear about in March. Mm -hmm. Again, it's just a rumor. Apple hasn't announced anything. We won't get in. They won't get invites. What am I saying? We they won't get invites until uh, the first or second week in March. Yep. Um, Apple is probably going to talk about iPad. I would think going to talk about iPads and other stuff, but maybe not. Maybe this just mm -hmm. it's, it's the, it's the word on the street is I mean, not. There are eh. rumors about new iPad Mini. It would, in a way, make sense because mm -hmm. the you reading, could read it on your yeah. Mini. Yes, reading on your mini. And the, by the way, an aside, the rumors say that the mini will still have a headphone jack. Weird. So why oh, the pro didn't weird. and the mini would is kind of weird. beyond me. But Courage. that's an aside. Kids. Courage. Could be, just you know could what? be the motherboard. Kids. Could be just the supplier for the smaller Maybe the mini factor. isn't a big upgrade. Who yeah. knows? We don't that know. makes a lot of sense about the motherboard. Yeah. Um, I, anyway, at, at, back, to, back to the point. Yeah. It, it could be involved, but I think it's probably just going to be about the News the and streaming. Yes, because the that's the other service Apple's supposedly shopping around. Remember, they've been acquiring like crazy. They have more than been, a billion dollars worth of new content. They have been making an increasing percentage of the revenue off of services and, yes. and recurring income. But and that's mostly the like App a, Store. It's not Apple really Apple Music. Yeah, maybe and, Apple and, Music and, and the App Store and, and Apple TV in general. Yeah, yeah. yeah so people buy movies off of Apple. Apple oh yeah. Care. Okay. I mean, they, if Apple the, were to put uh, together a bundled subscription where they're like, you get two to four movies a month plus access to these publications plus access to Apple oh, Music. Oh, you think it might be all one service? It could I, be. You know, one of the real concerns that people who are launching or maintaining a streaming service are going to have is what is the... What is the saturation point for consumers? Like how many streaming services do people want to subscribe to? And if you are Apple, what you can do is put together a media bundle and then present it as, we're not asking you to subscribe to a whole lot of things. We're giving you a one-stop shop. The same way that Amazon positions its prime stuff as a one-stop shop. Although I, I think that that would be really smart. Yeah. I don't think that's what they're going to do. Oh, I According to the Wall Street Journal, oh, and this is yeah. probably because publishers, including the Wall Street Journal, mm -hmm. 
leaked this. Yeah. Apple has gone to them saying, okay, here's what we're going to do. It's going to be $10 a month. Mm -hmm. We're going to keep half the money. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to divide the other half amongst you based on how much time people spend looking at your stuff. Oh, my God. And, oh, by the way, don't expect to get any of that subscriber information. And news publishers, that's, A, that subscriber information is hugely valuable. They can yes. market to them. The New York Times, I get lots of junk mm -hmm. from the New York Times and the Washington Post. B, Apple keeps 50% and, and gives us a, kind of an unknown share of the rest. The thing that is so weird to me about this is that, okay, let's say that you are a New York Times and or Wall Street Journal and or Washington Post subscriber. Maybe this will make sense for you if you get other stuff bundled in there and you really like the app, but most people do not pay for their news. No. So the idea that all of this is going to get bundled in something that is convenient, I don't think is enough. I, th I think that Apple is going to, it's going to be harder than Apple thinks. Well, it's worse than that for these, for the, let's say the Washington Post or, or the New York Times. So you're not going to get a lot of new people. Yeah. And people like me who pay full freight for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal, I'm going to say, oh, crap, I can just spend 10 bucks a month to get it all? That saves me money, if and you're so you're an going to lose them. you're Prime member, you pay practically nothing for a Washington Post subscription already. Yeah. yeah. So, so that I mean, that's a case of successful media bundling. But Amazon what, does not want me to dump that to no. go to Apple. No, no. But no. My, but to get back to my, 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 my insane theory about the merits of multimedia bundling. You pay for Amazon Prime, not only do you get the free shipping, yay, we're killing the planet, you also get access to yeah, this yeah. huge video no, library it's plus a super cheap Absolutely. rate on the Washington Post. Apple could, in theory, put something together like that. Where I keep getting hung up on is the whole, oh, we'll pay you according to user engagement because that is so disconnected from the quality of the editorial product you put That's out. Right. As sure. to be what it just it drives just, is link bait. It just drives link bait, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and the difference is that Amazon effectively yeah. owns. I mean, Amazon doesn't own the Washington Post, but yeah, Bezos owns it. Effectively, not yeah, it's very closely tied. Mm -hmm. Apple is much more of a third party for yeah. most well, of the people Apple's probably trying to work with. Yeah. Let's say that this is happening. I, first, I got to, with the full disclosure, my employer is part of the Condé Nast family. Condé Nast has been linked. They were part of Texture before. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will just say that subscriptions are sort of the next level for a lot of print media companies in terms of uh, putting paywalls on sites. That's becoming more of a thing. And I could see Apple going to these companies and saying, we have an idea for how to get you money for people who wouldn't otherwise pay and thinking that they're smart when these other companies are trying to say, no, 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 we're trying to sell our version of yeah. this. So I think what's going to happen is a lot. Of, I, I have no context on any of that stuff. I'm removed from all of that. But I do believe that is a battle that is going to play out for however long it takes for Apple to actually shout this out if it hasn't already been going on for months and why all the hiring happened before a product was released. I also want to point out, I was a former uh, contributor to The Daily, which we may all recall. Oh, this was that, Murdoch's uh, That play. iPad only magazine yeah, that I Apple and News that. Corp yeah. worked, worked on together where you paid a dollar a week, you had to read ads, you could only access that day's content, a total disaster. So Apple was closely linked to the beginning of that. There was no way that Apple News as an app, as a service, as a paid product will be in any way resembling that. I think you can look at that disaster, that burning You had a nice fire. newsroom though, didn't you? I, oh, I, I was freelance. I was here in Seattle. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I say. So you had a really uh, nice newsroom. I, yeah. I, did, yeah, I visited there once. It was lovely. They were, they were throwing money away, oh, but yeah. I do believe, look at what that was. Look at every single mistake it made and expect the exact, exact opposite in terms of access, so, design. Here's tone. Apple's pitch. Uh, the world is changing. Mm -hmm. You can't. You need digital subscriptions. We know everything there is to know about it. We're going to bring you a vast audience. We know it's a lucrative audience because they buy our crappy phone for twice as much as it's worth. No, they won't say that. But that's they've spent more this year on apps than they did the year before. That's right. They're, uh, they're a very engaged audience. We can solve your problem. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think Apple ended up getting fifty percent. But what if it's thirty percent? Well, you know? I don't know. And the, here's the other thing that that remains to be seen is whether or not people who are used to getting Apple News for free. We'll pay. We'll pay. Apple News is worth every penny you pay for it right now. Ooh. Which is it's the cost dreck. of the phone? Mm -hmm. It's dreck. I mean, it isn't good. Is it? Do you use it? No. No. I know, but I know uh, 
I know a lot of people who do. Yeah. Let's just see what's on the top. Because it's on their phone, yeah. right? You I, cannot, you cannot mom, overestimate. I've already moved it. I, I really, so it's sitting with, with the, the stocks app I, in I the Apple folder. I hate using the my mom metric for tech reporting the same way I hate using the, oh, my wife pointed this out. Like the implication that your female relatives can't use tech is just yeah. exploding. But my mother, who is a eager and enthusiastic adopter of technology at 70, got her first iPhone last year and is like hooked on Apple News. Yeah, yeah. Like she's always sending me articles that she found through Apple News. My mother too. And actually yeah. I like what you said because my mother is the only user of technology in my parents' household. Mm -hmm. My father my father doesn't have an email address. Yeah. So, so well, the, my mother my mother is the adopter mm -hmm. and she is an I eager would, adopter and yeah. she likes Apple News. I would yeah. think uh, Apple would know a lot about me. Mm -hmm. I've been using Apple News. I use other Apple products. In my top stories, for me, mm -hmm. I've got a golf story about, I don't even, I know I don't play golf, I don't follow golf, J.B. Holmes, slow play, criticized by announcers. Mm -hmm. I have a popular mechanic story on the Army's next infantry guns. <laughs> uh, I do have a couple of, you know, there's a politics story and a couple of tech stories, including why America's new apartment buildings all look alike. Mm -hmm. I, uh, my fear when I click this, and I bet you this, this uh, other people have this problem, is that if I fall for any one of these They're i'm going to get a lot more of the yeah. same it's meanwhile the <laughs> google which does also its own news let's see what its top stories are for me i think it might be a little bit better i don't know i'm, um, I'm looking at my apple now i'm now i'm doing the same Trump thing politics it's, it's not politics I, I, don't, I don't have the app on my phone. man discovers 30 year old <laughs> apple computer still in working order okay you can cross that it is sunday yeah uh uh, VR game sees huge increase in sales as players confuse it for Apex Legends. Okay, that's a good story. I might click on that. <laughs> Are you playing Apex Legends yet, Sam? Oh, yeah. I can tell you all about that if we get into Sam's gaming corner at any point. <laughs> well, it's a story because it did in two days what Fortnite took two weeks to do, get 10 mm -hmm. million subscribers. That was, well, Fortnite set but that up you, for them. I mean, now everybody knows what Yeah, that. that's right. They didn't have to explain it. Yeah. yeah. But you you made you made the point I wanted to make, which is that Google's news service, which pops up in Google now and in other ways, whether you're using Chrome or using an Android phone, it's doing it. I mean, I don't want to say more than that. It's much my better position, uh, as a as a web content creator. I think we all know some information about how well Google News does, and so Apple is going to have to, if it's going to jump into this, they're going to have to do it the Apple way, which uh, is the expensive that, way. It, yeah, it's kind of crazy though because Google News does it for free. And Google does an amazing job. This creeps me out, actually. But Google does a great job recommending for me new seasons of things that I've been watching on Amazon. Google is uncanny when it comes to the news at it's knowing. Weird. Of course, it knows everything, mm -hmm. knowing everything I want. It pushes stories at me that, it, that I will yeah. click. There's no reason in the world Apple should be pushing a golf story at me. This is maybe because Apple puts privacy first. Maybe this is a consequence of not spying on people. So mm -hmm. that's what they, that, they that, say. Well, we think you're an old guy who lives in Petaluma. You must like golf. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what they're doing. I think there's a, I think their sales pitch may very well go in that direction, mm -hmm. but it's also got to compete with it, really Apple News's best shot is Google messing up. Google yeah. sort of uh acting like an 800 pound gorilla and saying, gosh, be terrible if you as a news outlet lost all these clicks we've been helping you get. Well, uh, and I think that really is the thing that, because Facebook sort of went up in that direction and that, yeah. they, that has changed. The Looks what, look what's happening in Europe to Google at the behest of publishers in Europe, mm -hmm. like Axel Springer, mm -hmm. who think Google is the uh, arch, en is the arch enemy. The, well, the what I know right now is that when we do our editorial operations, we optimize for Google SEO and how can we get things more visible on Apple News is not a not question a priority. that we're, we're, yeah. we're asking yet. Maybe it will. Maybe it will be. Maybe it will. Uh, we look if at we both. Can, yeah. We look at both. And they're both mm -hmm. important in different ways. Do they drive uh, traffic? Mm -hmm. Apple News? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yep. What is the, I mean, you don't have to tell me if you can't, but what's the biggest traffic driver for you at this point? Is it Google Search? Is it Facebook? Is it Apple? Is it? It's Google. Google Search. Yeah. Yeah. Well, search is search, search with, if you, if you include AMP. AMP is an interesting story. Yeah. Yeah. I don't mm -hmm. think I'd give that's the 800 pound gorilla thing on their part. Yeah. yeah. And I know I'm not fond because, uh, yeah, it's a better user experience, mm -hmm. but everything has well, to go that's, through Google. But that's the thing. I don't know Google that people prioritizes wouldn't... AMP in their search results. Yeah. You get in that carousel at the top of the page. That's a better place to be than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's a, that's a real power play on Google's part. They pretend mm -hmm. it's the open web. It's not. Mm -hmm. It's 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 a really interesting time in publishing because things are changing so quickly. Things are and, and it mm -hmm. you know behooves everybody to be everywhere. I can remember I was having dinner with a couple PR people in 2006 and 2007 and 
talking about the frustration I had. I had pitched a story saying, how is Google changing the way we do news? And my editor wasn't biting. And I mentioned this to the PR people and she looked at me blankly and she said, well, I don't see how Google's affecting the way the media does their job. And I think about that conversation like once <laughs> Wait, a week. When was this? This was like in 2006. And again, I think about this conversation about once a week and, yeah. and, and wonder where we've all ended up since then. <laughs> it's so funny. I, in 2006, I was working for a weekly paper that was really struggling to get on the internet. It yeah. was, I was part of the um, New Times Village Voice Media Syndicate. Oh, and yeah. it was it was really pulling at teeth to get any sort of daily blog content up. It was about why are we not focusing on the print product? That was 13 years ago. Sam, you impressed me because if uh, I think I thought you were just like Super Mario Brothers addicted, mm -hmm. and you actually have very deep roots in in the in the real press in the mm -hmm. journalism. I have been a syndicated published author since 1996, my friend. I am very mm -hmm. impressed. You're older than you look. I'm 75 years old. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have a golf and guns article. You might be interested. In. Well, also tanks. It tanks? was like that's all my kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Phone and that giant Surface tablet thing. Oh yeah, I love this. Whiskey. Can love I get all of your this? You want my toys? I got the best toys. My colleague Richard Hay would cry oh, if he could lay is, his hands on that. He would love so it so much. Awesome. It's perfect for hosting a podcast. Mm -hmm. At least, a, or a television show, because it kind of gets out of the way at 15 degrees, and but it's big. And if I want to show something, I can, you know, I can telestrate it, and I can do this, and I can draw pictures on stuff, and you know, it's. I, you know, personally, I just want the next hollow lens to let me do that strapped to my face, mm -hmm. and I really do hope that's something that gets revealed. One that's week, coming. one week from today. In fact, we'll be covering that as well. 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern time on the 24th at Mobile World Congress. It's expected Microsoft will. To release HoloLens. Now, I see some stories say two, but it really would be three. They just mm -hmm. never released HoloLens 2. Mm -hmm. um, I think they just call it HoloLens. So I don't the think next gonna... HoloLens. Yeah. Um, uh, what do we know? What do we What do we think uh, about this? Peter Bright's writing it in Ars Technica. You guys have uh, the, such great the journals. The public information in terms of leaks is very thin. I just depend on my birdies between people I've heard from in HoloLens and from Magic Leap and other companies. And it's just basically a question of what the final decision is on the, on the manufacturing line of a wider aspect ratio and a faster chip and the amount of battery and how light and fluffy it all feels. It's really just going to boil down to which market they're going for, whether well, it's enterprise or whether they're ready for going to that sort of consumer level, buy it at Best Buy kind of thing. Bingo, and I really bingo. do believe it'll still be on the enterprise side. Because they've but hedged I, their bets. Initially with the HoloLens, they showed games, they showed Minecraft, they showed shooting things coming through the walls. Of late, they've really focused more on uh, the Windows, holographic windows, mm -hmm. on business applications, air traffic control, stuff like that. So you think they're going to double down on that and then leave the I game? I think you can look at their events where they've taken things like the Surface Tablet and some of these other incredibly nice specialized devices that are for specific kind of users to be their best device. And I think they want HoloLens to start out in that similar way so that as that trickles down, kind of like how the Surface Pro took them a while to finally nail, and then that began to trickle down to a more affordable model where now I feel like anyone I know who says, what do you think? And go, yeah, Surface, solid. And I think they're going to keep on that trajectory. They've got that established. And if they can just keep those parts getting cheaper and just, it's that field of view. For anyone who hasn't used HoloLens, it really does feel like a tiny little peephole into a virtual world. Have you used so Magic you look, Leap? I have. I've used them both and they're very similar in their aspect ratio. Meaning if you're not looking directly at the cuddly bunny that's magically appeared on your coffee table, it's not there. So if they can just get that wide enough to where people can suspend enough belief and have an imaginary desktop. Because again, that ability, uh, Windows 10 is about to roll out the ability to just take any desktop window and throw it into your VR uh, Windows holographic space. And that's the stuff, that sort of multi-monitor vision to be able to look around and have 20 different website tabs and email things if that's the kind of power <laughs> use you want. I mean, Sounds like heaven. That, yeah. <laughs> some people love a bunch of monitors. Some people want to keep it really focused. But I love that idea of just breaking like open the limit. You guys are both you using old MacBook Airs. The mic <laughs> if you take a look at the Microsoft tea leaves, one of the areas they've been devoting a lot of time and attention to over the last two to three years are their so-called first-line workers. Mm -hmm. That's uh, people in retail. Yeah, yeah. That's people in healthcare. Those are people who don't have desk jobs. 
And what they're trying to do is establish themselves as the go-to services, software, and hardware provider. And that's where Surface fills it, fits in, too. Surface sure. fits in there, and yeah. HoloLens will fit in, too, because if they can make forays into architecture, construction, um, your your infrastructure repair and uh, rebuilding areas, um, again, environmental challenges, things like that. This is where they perceive growth as opposed to back office. I enterprise. really like the new Mi uh, Microsoft. It's not the, not a beat I like to cover because I'm not an enterprise guy, but I am so <laughs> impressed. Me. No, I know. <laughs> I'm so impressed with what Nadella has done in yeah. five years, well, completely pivoting the company. I, and I think finding some real traction. I think that what, what you're saying is mm -hmm. correct, sort of broadly, which mm -hmm. is that Microsoft stands to benefit if they can create something that is really helpful to real people, yeah. but is also understandable and will be accessible by consumers. Yeah. And so I wouldn't be surprised if whatever Microsoft releases is something that we can all understand very well. Right. And that they do, have, they have, you know, what's interesting is if you go back to the first HoloLens and the reveal of the first HoloLens, I don't know if you guys remember that actual reveal mm -hmm. press event. Yes. But what was so impressive about it was that they did such a great job with the video that demoed it. Right. And as a journalist, the hardest thing about covering VR or AR is showing the audience what it's going to look like and helping right. people appreciate it because yeah. you cannot capture the experience of being inside well, we unless they do it As it turned out, it was a you. bit of a lie. It was a little bit of a lie, <laughs> but, but they did they a better did a good job. job. Yeah. And I think yeah. that they probably learned from that. So I wouldn't be surprised if whatever they, does, whatever they do does a good mm -hmm. job packaging that again mm -hmm. so that people can understand it. And then back to 5G... That's going to make a difference. When yeah. they're going to buy time, but get out in front of the story yeah. enough yeah. so that they get their name back in the conversation, yeah. leapfrog these other devices mm -hmm. that are have been out there over the last couple of years. Yeah. Make sure you remember Hololens, and then when 5G's here and it will make sense for everybody. Yeah sell it to everybody. Well, I think one of the advantages that Microsoft will has, have is if you're using it at work, it's nothing for you then to bring home a HoloLens and game with it. Yeah. Or yeah. something like that too. Um, just as, and this is at all loops and I promise, um, Google's apps have had a huge adoption rate, especially among younger adults who are just getting out of college. And there are workplaces that are now switching from Microsoft Office over to the Google App Suite because that's what their workforce has come up with. That's what they prefer sure. to use, things like yeah. that. And so Microsoft is doubling down on education because it, it wants to cut off the Google advantage and it also wants to get back into households. Apple at, is at trying to do time. that too. And surprisingly, yeah. given the Apple history, kind of failing yeah. at it. Well, they're pricey. They're too, they're too expensive. expensive. They're too Every pricey. kid yeah. I know uses yeah, Chromebooks and yes. that's it. They yeah. seem tone deaf, frankly, to the needs of uh, education. That's they why try. they have commercials with iPads and what's a computer? Right. Yeah. But even those are still too expensive. It's too expensive. Even at 329. Uh, Google, too yeah, Google tablets are fine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. so I've been wearing, and some of you have noticed this black ring for some time now. I got it uh, some, I don't know, it's almost, it's about six months ago. It's an Aura, O U R A ring, and it is uh, just fantastic. I first met. Uh, the founder of Aura through Kevin Rose. He is an advisor. He said, I'll get you one. He'd been wearing I said, what's that ring? He said, I'll get you one. You're not going to believe how cool this is. And then we had Harpreet uh, on the founder on uh, the new screensavers. They now advertise on the show. I'm very pleased about it. Uh, oh, I just got new ring firmware. I probably should update, but I won't do that right now. I'll show you. So this uh, ring ties to my smartphone, works with iOS or Android. It is the best fitness device ever. It has no screen. But that means it can be small. It's very lightweight. It's made of titanium, very tough. I can wear it in the shower. I can wear it when I swim. It tracks activity, yes, because it has built in, it has an accelerometer, it, you know, a gyroscope, but it also has uh, infrared optical pulse me measurement. That's really cool. And it's on your finger, which is the best place to measure your pulse, much better than the wrist. It has a body temperature sensor which means it's recording at all times your body temperature. And as a result, it is the best sleep monitor, the best exercise monitor I've ever seen. Here's last night's sleep score. I got a great score, 80. I'm refreshed and ready. I can see movement. I can see when I was awake. I had an hour and 52 minutes of REM, five hours of light. I had 21 minutes of deep sleep. If I tap on these, I'll get some insights about all this that tells you a lot about what these all mean. For instance, 21 minutes is... You see it's marked in red. That's a little bit low. And they'll even give you some suggestions about things you can do to improve that. I also can see things like my uh, how long it took me to fall asleep. Four minutes. That's pretty good. I was tired. Mm. Felt, <laughs> that's awesome. Mm. Sleep latency, they call it. I can see my resting heart rate. 
this is really valuable because uh, you know the only really way to test your resting heart rate is when you're resting. And since I don't sit down very often, it's really good to know that my resting heart rate's actually 55 beats per minute. That's mm -hmm. fantastic. It will give you a readiness score for every day based on a lot of things, including heart rate variability. It turns out, and they explain this uh, quite well, that the difference in time between your the beats of your heart is heart rate variability, and higher variability is better. So you can see in December, I was struggling a little bit. It had fallen down, but it's coming back now. That tied to things like my body temperature, and these are really infinitesimal differences, uh, less than a degree in most cases. My body temperature was down 1.2 degrees. That's probably why I slept so well. That's a very good indicator. If you're getting the flu, getting a cold, if you have stress or anxiety, it'll start to trend up. All of these things are super valuable in, in quantifying what's going on with your body and what it means for your day. Today, I am ready. 86 readiness score out of 100. It says your readiness is off the chart. Today's a great day to take it to the next level. They explain what it all means. They even show you a graph of your readiness score over a period of time, which hasn't been all that good. In fact, my readiness score really uh, <laughs> dipped down in November. I was, maybe that's why December was so rough. Aura is amazing. You get sleep insights, bedtime guidance that tells you it's time to go to bed now or it's better now. They'll tell you it's time to get a little exercise right now. You can tie it into your Apple Health so that means when I get exercise through my Apple Watch, it gets imported automatically into the Aura. That's really fantastic, including any information it knows about it. Uh, it it's readiness insights, recovery optimization. So I know if, you know, maybe it's not time to lift weights today, or maybe this would be a great time to go for a, a run. Resting heart rate, heart rate variability, body temperature, respiratory rate. You can have daily activity goals. It'll track activities, steps, calories, inactivity alerts. And this feedback really is the most rich, valuable information I've ever got from any fitness device I've ever used. It's amazing. That's the good news. The bad news is these are selling out like crazy. And I, f I feel terrible because uh, this date has been slipping. When we first started doing the advertisements, I think it was get it by April, right, or March. Now they're out to May because these things are, are flying off the shelves. One other thing you'll like, read the privacy policy. This is a company from Finland, so they're governed by GDPR. Aura is available in eight sizes. In fact, they'll send you a ring sizer if you go to their website. There's two shapes. There's the round shape or the balance shape that I'm wearing, which has a little uh, kind of uh, a flat surface on it that makes it kind of striking. I love my Aura. Now, charging. It lasts for a week. So I have a, you have a little charger base. looks looks kind of like this. It is like this. That's it. And you put that on your dresser or wherever. And when you're, all I really do is when I'm showering or, you know, I'm going to, um, you know, showering's a good time to do it. Brush my teeth. I'll put it on there. 10 minutes. It keeps it charged up. It syncs to your device using Bluetooth LE. So it's very fast. Uh, the memory in the ring is up to six weeks. So don't feel like you have to pair it or, you know, connect it to your phone every day. It'll, it'll take up to six weeks of data. So this thing is basically maintenance-free. You don't even pay attention to it. It's just recording. Whenever I think of it, I open up the app, copy the data off. The app uh, is free for iOS and Android. And as you saw, the regular updates. In fact, I just got a firmware update. Track your sleep. Make the most of your day. If you're an athlete, if you just want to know more about what's going on, why you're feeling great today and not so great the next day, AuraRing.com, O-U-R-A-R-I-N-G.com. $50 off if you use the Twit offer code. But you have to order now to get it by May. Do it. It's worth it. I know that's kind of, you get excited about something, you want it tomorrow. I waited for a few months to get mine. I'm really glad. Lisa wears it too. AuraRing.com. Use the offer code TWIT. Let's see. Last uh, bits of things. The BuzzFeed journalists after the layoff are going to unionize. Uh, but Bloomberg told me about it because nobody at BuzzFeed's <laughs> reporting on that. Uh, does that scare you, uh, Lindsay, as management at CBS Interactive? You know, it's not... No. Unions exist for a reason, and mm -hmm. and I think that publications who need them will have that come up. Yep. I'm AFTRA. SAG, too. Although nobody's hired me for a movie yet. I'm ready. You ready? I got my card. You're qualified. I'm qualified. There you go. I got my SAG card. I'm just saying. Well, you're probably then in a position to speak specifically to what unionization does and doesn't do. And I think that can get lost in a lot of these stories. Oh, it's so important. 
And it's real. It's interesting because ultimately, what it's saying for <laughs> employees, especially in a trade like writing, is the realities of publishing cannot be changed. But employees underneath the top brass uh, want a seat at. A bargaining table, right. mm -hmm. especially in the case of, well, our decision is we are going to have a bunch of layoffs. So at least there can then be a conversation for those affected of saying, maybe some people want to take voluntary layoffs. Mm -hmm. Maybe some people want to have that guarantee of a 30 or 60 day notice and a certain amount of severance. Uh, and I think that's that that is a thing, the story that is, I think, becoming more well uh, spoken, but it can still get lost sort of in uh, either anti-union or just confusion about it. So I think all this is a saying is that uh, BuzzFeed is perhaps the best primed to speak to what they would like at a bargaining table for the case of future giant wide out of nowhere layoffs. So, and I have to say, you know. for a, a, an actors' union like SAG and AFTRA, uh, the advantage of having union health insurance when you're in a gig economy is huge, <laughs> and that is one very good reason to have a union if you're going to be in a business where you're gigging. Uh, you know, moving from job to job, you're not going to have consistent benefits. So having the benefits provided by the union is well, uh, well worth it. Well, did you see there were two stories that Bloomberg did, I believe a week to a week and a half ago, where a 2016 Google memo got, got released into the wild among the Google employees? Uh, deep, deep, is this story familiar? Vague memory of this. In the first story, it turned out that the meat of the memo was, what are ways we can reduce the expense associated with having employees? <laughs> And Yikes. contract well, employees. No, no, no. You're, you're, you're getting ahead of me here. Because okay. in, in the first story, the two practices that now have employees feeling not very great about Google was they were proposing slowing down the promotion cycle. Right. And the reasoning was the employees don't realize that we used to promote on X months. So if we do X plus Y, they won't care and we can stretch out expenses. Um what this does for employee morale when they've been busting their butt and they don't see anything relative to earlier coworkers is not addressed, just, oh, we can stretch out the expenses. The second thing had to do with bonuses because typically Google managers were awarded, a, were given a pot of money and, and it was, please disperse this as bonuses to your employees. When they do something bonus worthy as you see fit, there's no schedule, it's highly situational. And HR had noticed that managers often needed to be reminded they had the pots of money because they were very busy being Googlers. They didn't know better. Um, and so HR was like, let's just stop reminding people. <laughs> they'll just forget. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they'll forget. And so Googlers were a little bit worked up about this because it basically comes down to, oh, our company is now slowing down our advancement prospects and adding friction to the bonus. Yeah. The, yeah. the second story that came out was another idea that got floated was, why don't we just make everybody at Google a contractor? Yeah. And a lot of tech companies do this. And um, well, the, there's there was a piece in Bloomberg again this last week talking about Apple's black site, which sounds yeah. much more sinister than actually it was. It really was. Lots of Apple employees get to work in the pretty new building. There's another yeah. building get, nobody talks about where the contractors work. Yeah. But well, and we saw that story at Google yeah. where people were saying, oh, you're not invited to the lunch because you're a contractor. Yeah, you can't exactly. come to that meeting. But it illustrates the caste There's systems a real caste system where you know, employees and have protections that contractors do not. I actually have a, a dog in this hunt because I'm both an employer and a union member. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I understand both. Uh, honestly, yeah. it's difficult these days. It's very difficult to have a business. And, and of course, you're always trying to cut costs. But there is nothing more valuable than your employees. And treating your employees right ultimately is the best form of business treating customers and employees right that's like 90 percent of the game mm -hmm. sure yeah, I think I think. in the end if you're a human who be a relates human. to employees yeah. as mm -hmm. humans you're in a pretty good spot sometimes sometimes you have to do some yeah. pretty inhumane things as a business owner well, one of the things i found so interesting to, about the know. buzzfeed layoffs in addition to the way they were just drawn out like a yeah that's like one thing that's inhumane minutes. But one of the things I thought was interesting were how many BuzzFeed employees were taking to social media to effectively live tweet the story as yeah. it was happening, yeah. both the ones who were laid off and the ones who were left behind, how quickly they organized a directory of alumni who were going to need work, and then how quickly they organized. That's again, awesome. All over social media, yep. though, but this was usually with layoffs, you, you see the numbers but you don't have people flooding social media to tell you their visceral there, reactions. There aren't secrets anymore. And yeah. this is another problem. A lot of businesses say, don't. the worst thing that could happen to us is if employees started sharing their income, their salaries, because yeah. then people would have negotiating power against us. Mm -hmm. And I have feelings on both sides of that fence as well. I think <laughs> it, 
it's a, actually a, probably a good thing for employees, not mm -hmm. such a good thing for employers who want to pit him, often want to pit employees against one another. Mm -hmm. uh, to that point about social media, that there was a similar uh, layoff story in the games and tech industry this week with Activision Blizzard mm -hmm. laying off nearly 800 uh, just whoosh. And there were people who kind of expected it, who had been given warnings as far back as November. Uh, but there was also the fact that they said they're not only they're doing a 8% net layoff, but they also said they are hiring 20% more developers, which means more blood is going to be shed beyond that initial 800. So that's a story that's going to keep on going. And the immediate social media, media reaction was one, mobilization for people saying we've got jobs and we're hiring in the game design world and all these different proficiencies and cities. And number two, a games unionization effort that's just been exploding. There's just been a lot more people on the independent and uh, corporate ladders all trying to band together and create that sort of movement. That's been very interesting to watch. Let's uh, go in the Sam corner right now with a couple of game stories. Pokemon Go, Niantic, which is a Google spinoff. They were the Google Maps guys who created Niantic, created Ingress. In the process, when they created Ingress, they created used Google Maps mm -hmm. to create uh, augmented reality, imaginary locations on top of real locations, like the post office and churches and monuments. Pokemon Go played off those same maps. They actually used the same locations instead of uh, Niantic's uh, or Ingress locations. They're Poke Stops, Poke Gyms. Well, there was a class action lawsuit against Pokemon Go from a bunch of homeowners saying that Pokemon Go was leading players to congregate on or near private property. They sued. Pokemon Go creator Niantic has agreed to become more legally responsible. There, <laughs> this uh, there were uh, this all started in 2016 when Pokemon Go came out, and you may remember the mobs that happened. I think that Niantic is settling now because they're getting ready for a game that will be even bigger, which is the Harry Potter version of the mm. same game. Oh wow! And they'll have the same locations because they don't create new locations for the new games. So now they've been they've been pulling from Ingress ever since the beginning. Ingress started with was Ingress. essentially the breeding ground yep. right. for for all of that data, and that's why Pokemon Go opened up with a very lively world because its insane beta testers were all over the United States and other countries yep. grokking it out. I mean, honestly, I would I would say it's just as simple as them saying we don't have a case. Uh, and because Niantic plus all of the other backing they have could absolutely lawyer up and fight this and keep all of that stuff. And I think it's just the kind of thing where they go, yeah, we are profiting off of other people's well, private enterprise. It's kind of the well, right thing minute. to do. Well, it's kind well, of but wait a minute. Like there's a I wish I had a pokey stop outside the front door here. It's not mm -hmm. in somebody's house or on property property. It's near private property. But if you are using the photo of the property and the name of the property, which Oh, in all okay. of the Pokestops oh, sure. and gyms in my neighborhood typically are the name of the business somehow involved yeah. and a photo of said business. Now, that Starbucks was, pays good money to have every Starbucks sure. be a Pokestop. Yep, they're opting into that and, yeah. and probably getting paid as a result. I mean, Absolutely. I think there's... there's Allowed to opt in. It's interesting. I, I have some friends who used to be graffiti artists mm -hmm. and they, you know, not legal they at all. They say used to be, but not I think they Not legal at all, but, but really like... There was a code of ethics around mm -hmm. what yeah. you tag and what you yeah. don't. Good. Uh, and and you can agree with the code of ethics or not, but right. it was roughly if it's public property, i.e., paid for by taxpayers, it's fair game. <laughs> if it's a private home mm -hmm. or yeah. a small business, do not yeah. do it. And I think that that's kind of like you don't tag or you don't that's tag nice. somebody's like yeah. bakery, yeah. right? And and so the idea that <laughs> idea is kind of like what's going on yeah. with my attic here. So no, you know, here's an example. Grandma, here's an example of one of the lawsuits. Make someone's grandma a place the residents of the Villas of Positano, an oceanfront condo in Hollywood, Florida, during the height of the Pokemon Go phenomenon, would wake up in the early morning hours to hundreds of players behaving, quote, like zombies, walking around, bumping into things. <laughs> uh, we've had to redefine what trespass is in the digital age, literally. Mm -hmm. And uh, Pokemon Go, the Niantic folks uh, said, that upon complaints of nuisance or trespass, this, you might want to keep this in mind when the Harry Potter game comes out. Upon complaints of nuisance or trespass and demands of the removal of a pokey stopper gym, the company will uh, uh, make commercially reasonable efforts to resolve the complaint and communicate a resolution within 50 day, 15 days. I'm sure they'll take it down, right? Oh. Owners of single family residential properties get rights of removal within 40 meters mm. of their properties. That seems fair. Yeah, that seems fair to me. Niantic got... will maintain a database of complaints in an attempt to avoid poor placement. When this is my favorite, when Niantic system detects a raid of more than ten players congregating, yeah. 
A warning message will appear on their screens reminding them to be courteous and respectful of surroundings. That's just so like actually, the one that pops. There's one that pops up when you're in a car. If it, expect, it senses a movement of 15 or more miles an hour, it'll say, Are you, you a know, passenger? Are you a passenger? Are you a passenger? And the driver just taps, yeah, okay. Every you know. time you start Pokemon Go, it says, don't trespass. The it restrictions says that. on single-family residential properties and the warnings that pop up, there was a really great story on Curbed. I want to say either late last week or the beginning of this week. Curbed is um, you know, a publication that focuses on real estate, does long-form essays. And there was one where a woman was talking about how a friend of hers who lived in a beautiful house in Savannah, the friend was going through chemotherapy. And, and was very, very sick. And there was an influencer posing in front of her house oh, and doing oh, the thing on the Jesus. porch and jumping around. The influencer posted something on her social media all, I don't know why the owner was so grumpy when I was taking pictures. She uh, should take advantage of her location and set up a mimosa stand. Oh, please. But what it points out is the idea that for people who have built up these, these um, AR type environments. And I would argue that Instagram at this point is basically AR. Sure. Um, for people, they forget that people live in those yes. houses and those are their private residences and you are interrupting their lives and they are not props in your well, little world they, building exercise. Yeah, I feel that influencers forget that in public places or not. I mean, I... I think I we had, should just line them all up against the wall and shoot them. Influencers are not good in any respect whatsoever. That's so the, story, it's the greatest the twit influencer ever. of them all. I got, I got a really... Not me! I got a really nasty look in yeah. the gym locker room because I walked behind a woman who was posing. I'm Instagramming here. Who was Instagramming in front of the mirror in Which the is locker probably room breaking no, my, no cell phone. My gym bans mobile yeah. phones in the locker room. You're not allowed yeah. to bring them All out, gyms which, do. Is, which is Doesn't great. Doesn't stop but, anybody. Yeah, but it yeah. was, I, yeah. I was just oh, kind of I like, complain. I'm a mean woman. I'll complain. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. But you know this, this, this. It's. I think that's going to be one of the things that people who, the, especially digital natives, and those of us who have become digital natives by default, are going to have to remember is just because you have this bubble of information and experience as you move through your world with your tech, your bubble is going to bump into other people's bubbles. You're going to overlap, and they have just as many rates as you do, and you're going to have to remember that. That's a really good. Next point. time you hear Tom Jones, mm -hmm. it's not unusual, and you're tempted to put a cassette in and play that song, grab a candlestick and sing along. Get ready, everybody. I want you to do the Carlton dance. It's not unusual to be loved Unfortunately, it's not unusual. Carlton got bad news this week. The Carlton dance is not copyrightable. He was suing Fortnite because you can buy a Carlton dance. Do they call it uh, the Carlton dance? In, they do uh, not call it the Carlton dance. <laughs> well, Carlton himself admits he kind of borrowed it from Bruce Springsteen dancing in the dark video <laughs> and other other places. Uh, Carlton, of course, is played by Alfonso Ribeiro. Uh, it, 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 I think this is over now because the copyright office said you can't. Sorry, kid. It's not a choreographed routine. You can't copyright it there were oh, other i don't think i don't think that his i think his case may be over but i do not uh i do believe that the idea of these microtransactions in games attached to real life anything is going to continue i think people will continue to push whatever uh public image they have and uh cultural cachet in order to say uh, hey, you are profiting off of my likeness or something that is singularly like me and you are making money and I'm not getting a cut and I was not reached out to for a license. Uh, whether, I, I think there's that's not necessarily, it may be more clear cut in certain cases than others. There was just recently a, a suit filed by a WWE superstar whose likeness seems to be in the latest Call of Duty game in terms of his just facial structure well, and see, hair right. and general presence and that he's not in any way being compensated and if, whether or not he deserves to be paid uh, when he may just innocently coincidentally resemble. Because so many works of fiction have that all similarities are coincidental and blah, blah, blah. The NBA blah, so. has been dealing with this for a while, too. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think we've got the same kinds of conversations going on with likenesses of sports figures. It's tattoos. So, for instance, the tattoo artist owns the tattoo. These NBA all-stars are allowed to play games 
-hmm. in the NBA with these tattoos. But when those same All Stars are rendered as a likeness in NBA the 2K, are gone. the tat no, they're not gone, well, and the tattoo out. artists are saying, "Wait a minute, that's oh. my copyrighted work in your game." Oh, that's they interesting. Could just uh, they could eliminate that just by making them uh, not I different. Think it all, but they wouldn't it be the all same. Has to do but then I just give it a six point oh, five yeah, out of ten. Like, exactly, Igadala's Sam would say those uh, tattoos yeah. are not you accurate. Can't be Iguodala without the wing. But I think this is in the digital uh, entertainment world, microtransactions are going to be only bigger and bigger and bigger, especially as emerging economies are completely linked into payments through phone currencies, where you are going to a convenience store, for example, in Japan, which is mostly a cash society, mm -hmm. that's you're going and paying cash to get the card and loading that and buying points and getting all these little things. So when you say that this might be the last of it, I 100% disagree that our digital future includes all of these cute little purchases of cosmetic bits. And what's more interesting in a cosmetic way than things you recognize? That's why games like Super Mario Maker, where you make your own levels, the most popular things in that game that people create are based on other real life properties. Like that's just how this weird future of how we pay for things online is going to play out and games will be on the forefront of that. So well, I think this is going to continue being a big legal conversation. Tiny, incremental, and frictionless. Tiny, incremental, frictionless. That sounds like the, my the love whole... life. Oh. oh. I quit. <laughs> <laughs> that just shut down this conversation entirely. Oh my. I'm sorry. Yeah, about to file suit. <laughs> uh, I don't even know what I was going to say. It's just But gone. we do have a show title. I am grateful to you for calling that out. So what about, uh, so there were two big games this week. It's so funny because people hate electronic arts, right, Sam? <laughs> they hate it. They hate it. It's the devil. It's Satan. It's this, it's so. They've had a bad reputation for yes. gobbling up companies and then having those yes. games, those companies do different and, things and than they did. And people are so pissed off that EA has a hit. But of course. I disagree about them being. EA has a hit. That is definitely true. This is Apex uh, Legends. Just came out, as I mentioned earlier, already 25 million players. Uh, it's well, that a, was like five days ago they said 25 oh, right. million. So I imagine that has only grown. That's it's on, a battle it is royale on, game. 100 men come in. 100 people come in. 60 only one, people come in. 60. And, and oh, well, there, see, it's not like Fortnite. Uh, it's, yeah, exactly. Well, they're, they're, what, they're, so here's what I think Apex Legends did for all of the people, mostly between the ages of like... 13 and 18 who don't play Fortnite anymore because it's not cool and it's for little kids. Mm -hmm. They get Fortnite. They did play it. And Apex Legends is cooler. So they're all uh, in. It's funny, though. It just Legends shows you because it looked like we were doing stories two weeks ago that Fortnite was a future of social media. Yeah. The I, was just, I was just thinking that as I was reading all these stories about how Fortnite is the new shopping mall for teenagers. Oh, no. But no, 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 no. Because uh -huh. teenagers like they're fickle. six months ago yeah. were actual teenagers were like that's for 12 year olds yeah so oh, that's right. 16 year old say, says that yep yeah. yeah number one fortnite is still doing great they still have a ton of players and that will eventually end and everyone knows how fads work i think epic games the people who make fortnite are absolutely gearing up for that and that's why the game changes so much yeah. that's why it has these seasons uh but apex legends what it did ea had a pretty smart move they took a bunch of people who go on Twitch and YouTube and stream themselves playing games and said, we're going to pay you cash to just play this game all at the same time. And then those people, once that money stopped, kept playing the game and said, I'm having a pretty good time. You guys developed a solid game. Mm -hmm. And everyone could kind of see that instead of a year, two years of hype and expectation and mm -hmm. questions. Because if EA came out, and in fact, some of the people who worked on this game said, if we put out a press release a year ago and said EA is going to make a game with loot boxes and microtransactions and it's battle royale <laughs> the forums and everything there just would have been this giant wall of resistance so instead you get uh this game that just shows up and people playing it and saying kind of like it gonna keep playing it it's yeah. free it's on xbox it's on playstation it's on computer the friction is so low for people to just jump in and it has a really genius thing yes. in the internet age. It's pinging. The idea is that anywhere you look in the game, you tap a button and it announces to your friends in the game, here's a thing, a weapon, an mm -hmm. item, ah. a path you should go to. So you can play without using a microphone. You can mute idiots on the internet and play and have a good time. Oh my this gosh, to me that is like a value. Is, they should charge extra for that feature. Every like, single game, so I, I swear to you, every game from here on out that's internet dependent 
is going to do this little thing of called pinging, uh, which is a term that we've used in way different ways than in gaming. But it's genius. It was really smoothly done. EA is kind of incredible in how they pulled this off. And they're about to launch a game that's kind of the utter opposite. That's kind of a mess and a disaster and overhyped and under-delivering. So the What's fact that? that? It's called Anthem. Oh. And that's made by a yeah. company that did games called Mass Effect and Dragon Age. People have and been, I am, this Anthem, people have been very excited about this. You think it's terrible, huh? It, I, I'm working on my review as we speak. I'm basically, when I'm not talking I think we know where it's you, going. <laughs> it's, it's a problem. There's some problems with this. Oh. It's a game that has beautiful ideas. It, you get to fly around like Iron Man, and it feels like you're Iron Man. You get in a jetpack, and you fly over a giant world, and that's cool. But the game has nothing but roadblocks. Apex Legends, you can just jump in for free, and it instantly feels cool. This game is the opposite, where you have to pay money, and you're waiting and waiting, and it's yeah. slow and clunky and it feels old and it's just interesting that ea said we're going to put both of these out at the same time yeah. what's that going to look like yeah. I, if i worked on anthem i would be furious because i've got this other thing i have to juggle from my corporate parent just bringing me down you buried the lead though now tetris has a battle royale mode Ooh, oh the tetris has a battle royale <laughs> Did you ever want to play Tetris with 98 other people? Probably not. Yeah. But that now exists, and it's actually incredibly fun. Um, I wrote up a piece that sort of analyzed what it does, and I think this is going to trickle down in other games in the future, but the briefest way to put it is it adds a sort of machine learning difficulty, meaning these other 98 people you're playing against, you don't see them. You're focusing on your own set of Tetris blocks, which are already doing the random things that make it hard. You know, you get that Z piece when you want to line, that sort of thing. Well, now it's got this sort of automatic challenge of other people throwing what are known as garbage blocks at you. Oh. So you get the sort of extra little oh, organic spike of challenge if you don't just want to play some chill Tetris by yourself. And I think for a game as old as Tetris, that's a risk they can take. Uh, I, I don't know that every other genre should have this, but it's this really brilliant thing and it's free if you pay for Switch's online service, which is $20 a year. And that also comes with a bunch of classic NES games for free. So Nintendo has come out to fans of games and said, you're getting classic NES games and you're getting a new trippy Tetris for $20 for a year. And I really do believe that drove people to say, oh, hey, Nintendo, you're normally behind on the times with online stuff. Oh, this is actually kind of sweet and novel and clever, and I'm going to pay that very small amount of money for classic gaming. So really smooth move on Nintendo's part and all. I've been playing this Tetris game. It's working. It's not crashing. I'm having a good time. I'm really good at it, so that helps. Yeah, I'm just going to warn actually people. It sounds like the way they do weighted grades in law school where there's the curve, and <laughs> like one or two people per class gets an A, and then it goes down from there, and well, everybody Sam Red's is psyching the a, each other apparently. out. Watch all out. I know is Watch I, out for Sam Red on Tetris 99. I thought I was really good at Tetris. Yeah. Like I used to play like crazy a mm -hmm. long time ago and then I played with my daughter on a plane, mm -hmm. like on the seat backs and we were playing against each other. And it got to a point where I was like, this isn't fun anymore. I don't want to play. <laughs> I don't like it. And she's like, if, do you uh, want to let I, you I'm, in, mom? Oh, that's it was I just brutal. want to put something out there for the listeners who want to know about a world of an intense competitive Tetris. There is a 16-year-old kid who is currently breaking world records left and right. His name is Joseph Saley, S-A-E-L-E-E. -E -E. I encourage you to look him up on YouTube. He does things with NES Tetris that I never knew were possible. He's in, He's got a method called hyper-tapping. Go down that rabbit hole if you want. I swear it is. I'm pretty sure that my daughter did that because I was like, "How do you even know how to do this? She's how have been you ever played YouTube this?" Videos. No, she. Yes, she goes. Oh, I just watch it on YouTube. Yeah, I'm using That's the, the Saley technique. This kid has reached level 33 in NES Tetris, with nobody thought was possible. That just happened like three nights ago, and he's just hanging out in a, in his little you know house in his this family's is a new kind of Twitch. Place. I gotta tell you, is this on oh, Twitch? He's, yeah, he's got a whole, the whole screen that he's got set up, like adapts the board so it looks right. I just, I, I'm obsessed with this kid. It's, he's, he's my, he's, he's my not Michael even Jordan. looking at the screen. Yo, he'll look over at the, the chat way. over to the side yeah. just to make sure he talks he's to his like, Twitch people. Uh, I don't even have to think about it anymore. It just happens. Yeah, look at this. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, he's, the, this is, this oh, is what yeah, your he, daughter's doing. Yeah, she's watching him play and then she's just killing me on the airplane Tetris. Oh, I'm so glad I could talk about Joseph Saley. He's the best. He's a really sweet kid too. Well, on this that note, unbelievable. we will uh, We're just this. entranced. <laughs> We're all watching this kid. Just, I can't I believe it. I see Tetris meets Minecraft. Oh, my God. Oh, well. Mm. This, you know, is, this is, you see, this is the thing. 
I have to say, Lindsay, is that this your kids and this guy, it's not even the same species. Oh, watch the, oh he didn't do it. He has a tuck method. Sorry. Sorry, anyone who's oh, listening to this. Oh, he needed to use that tuck thing. method, man. Oh, oh he his, his tuck, tuck method, method is beyond compare. I'm so glad Where I get to slides, talk like this. He slides a piece over into a, a little hole that's just kind of Oh, yeah, he can do all these in. weird. Yeah, oh, he can do. Oh, man. He's got some weird T-spin things I and all this. I swear to God, a, this kid's not language. even thinking about what he's doing. It's just biological at this point, yeah. right? It's just Well, incredible. he's got a whole bunch of brain circuits completely dedicated. Dedicated. He's got yeah. Look at this. He's not even looking. The spatial. <laughs> he's not even looking. The spatial intelligence is just off the charts. That's wow. what it is, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I have almost no spatial intelligence whatsoever. So this is this is like pops and whistles and, and dolphin noises as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> 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 Yeah, your your video editor should have fast forwarded to the part where he gets up to the to the very max, but that could take forever. Oh, I could jump uh, jump ahead. Is that at the end of the video? I'd say like it. Oh, a little bit back. Go back a little bit. Back. Bit. Oh, he just finished. Because he's clutching All right, his heart. We got it. Like okay, here we go. Yes, this Look, is he's it. doing hyper tap. He's hyper tapping. Ladies, I can't believe it. Is is Saley doing the hyper tap? Yes, he is. He's moving in. Watch his tuck method. It's incredible. Oh my god, it's moving faster than I can even I mean, keep track just of. The oh! fact that the fact that he could do any of that. It's. I mean, the, the, the level the is so high. Is it's in there. hexadecimal. Oh, oh, my thank God. You. Thank you for humoring me. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of this very <laughs> strange journey that we've been on. But you know what? I wouldn't want to be uh, with any other three people in this fellowship of the weird. Uh, thank you so much, Sam Maskovich, for joining us. Sam writes at Ars Technica. He's their tech culture editor. He has to run off and write his anthem review. Get to Fly off in a jetpack. Fly off in a jetpack. Sam Red on the Twitter. And stay away from Sam Red on the Tetris because he's... Killer. Killer. Thank you, Sam. Always a pleasure to have you on. Happy to be on with you. Lindsay Turretine, despite her title of VP of Technology Content at CBS Interactive, has deigned to come into this room and <laughs> join us and get into the it's trenches. So fun to be here. You're a big shot now. Yeah. I can't even talk to you anymore. Yeah. Lindsay, it's yeah. always a pleasure. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. What a smart panel. I can't, I am just so thrilled to have all you uh, folks. Schmeiser, always a pleasure, Lisa Schmeiser. Now, you're still editor IT Pro today, but you're focusing on enterprise mostly. Yes, now. yes, I am. No more of that Windows Secrets crap. Well, I wouldn't call it crap. We had a lot of really talented writers who did a great job of ushering no, the readers into this. the mobile first. There's no more secrets. I feel like it's... There's no look, more secrets. I'm not going to run down my successor, though. Come on. Secrets are over. <laughs> Everything's public now. That's the problem. Yeah. So great to have you, Lisa. ITProToday.com. Thank, you. It Thank yeah. you all for being here. We had a great studio audience. Thank yeah. you for joining us. I know it was a bit of a marathon. Yeah. I hope you brought sandwiches. <laughs> uh, and I did offer you whiskey, I think, right? Okay, good. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> they have their Starbucks instead. Uh, it's really great to have them. From um, Michelle and David from Manteca, California, Travis and Beth from Los Angeles. It's kind of a romantic thing to do on a Sunday afternoon. Come watch Twit. Oh, boy. It's not raining today. The drive is lovely. Yeah. Thank you for being here. If you want to join us, all you have to do is email tickets at twit.tv. We'll put a chair out for you. You can also watch a live stream of uh, everything we do at uh, twit.tv slash live. Choose from audio or video. Uh, you can, If you can't watch it live, you can always get on-demand audio and video from our website, twit.tv. Of course, the best thing to do let Daniel Eck know we exist. Subscribe to the show on Spotify, please. Mm. That won't help. And again, nothing he wants. Or your favorite podcast application. I don't mind. Pocket Cast, Overcast, iTunes, Google. There's a lot of great ones. We have the information at twit.tv slash subscribe. Subscribe to our newsletter while you're there, too. You'll know ahead of time all the great things that are coming to Twit in the week ahead. Thanks to our producer, Costin Bondi, our executive producer. Who would like to remind you to plug the survey. Lisa Kensel, uh, Lisa Laporte, I married her. So that's one way to save money. Google didn't think of that. Yeah. You just marry your employees, then you don't have to pay them anymore. Uh, that doesn't work. It's, some weird doesn't scale. it's hard to scale. Yeah, I was going to say, that does not scale well. Yeah. Uh, I saw a big love. I know how this ends. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you run out after a while of houses. Uh, we do have a survey. We do this once a year. We uh, ask you to take it only because it's the best way. We We don't track you. We don't know anything about you we don't want to but we do like to have some information about our audience advertisers like to know is there male female what ages things like that so it's very simple demographic questions we also like to know a little more about what you're interested in so we can tailor our programming to fit your interests the survey is quick take you a couple of minutes twit.to slash survey no salesman will call i'm sorry twit.to slash survey 19 it's the 2019 version 
I know you do. You did this. Did you do the census already? This is much easier than the census. Twit.to slash survey 19. We're not collecting any information about you. It's all in aggregate, but it does help us very much to plan our year. So thank you in advance. And thank you for being here. We'll see you next week. Another Twit is in here. Bye. Doing the Twit. Doing the Twit.